Okay, let's, let's go ahead and get started. Um, good morning to those in North and South America. Good afternoon to those in the UK and Europe and good evening to those in Asia and the Pacific. My name is Aaron Wheeler. I am a professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Chemistry with a cross appointment in the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. On behalf of my colleagues at the University of Toronto and at the Welcome EPSRC Center for Interventional and Surgical Sciences, known as the WISE at University College London, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Microrobotics and Single Cell Micromanipulation for Medicine mini symposium. Because some of us are in Toronto, I've been asked to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Credit River. Today, this space is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Our symposium today features an exciting slate of research presentations that are distributed into two sessions. The first session features four presentations headlined by keynote speaker, Derek Vanderkoy from the University of Toronto. After a brief break, the second session will also feature four presentations headlined by keynote speaker, Kasim Rafiq from University College London. Be sure to stick around after the second session for a special announcement followed by concluding remarks. And after the symposium concludes, the content will be made available on YouTube on the Weiss website. As the symposium proceeds, our speakers will be happy to answer your questions. We encourage you not to wait to ask them. Type your questions when you have them using the Q&A function. To reiterate, please use the Q&A function rather than the chat function. Most importantly, while some questions will be addressed, it is possible that we will not be able to answer them all. That's fine. Please view this symposium as the beginning of an ongoing discussion rather than a static report. Our speakers have assured me that they will be happy to continue the conversation in the days and weeks to come. Finally, I would like to thank in advance the sponsors of the symposium, which include the EPSRC from the UK, INSERC from Canada, the University of Toronto, and the WISE at University College London. With that, I'm happy to turn the reins over to the chair of our first session, Professor Cindy Mooreshead of the University of Toronto. Okay, thank you very much, Erin. Uh, really looking forward to today's symposium. And uh, to get us started, um, it's a real pleasure for me today to welcome Dr. Derek Vanderkoy as our keynote speaker. Uh, as we focus on single cells and specifically stem cells, and their potential use in medicine, there really is no better person to learn from. It was his lab that discovered tissue-specific pancreatic stem cells, as well as retinal stem cells in the eye, which is the topic of today's lecture. Dr. Vanderkoy is a professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics at the University of Toronto. His lab focuses on stem cell biology, developmental biology, genes that are important for learning and memory in worms, and the neurobiology of motivation in rodents. So it's quite diverse expertise that his group has. Derek received his master's in psychology at the University of uh, British Columbia in Canada, a PhD in anatomy, first at the Erasmus University in the Netherlands, and finishing in the Department of Anatomy at the University of Toronto, where he currently has his lab. He gained his postdoctoral research experience at Cambridge University in England and at the Salk Institute in California. So Derek Vanderkoy is going to kick off our symposium today with his talk entitled Microfluidic Magnetic Sorting Allows Purification of Mouse Retinal Stem Cells and Reveals the Mechanisms of Their Adult Quiescence. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Derek. Okay, thanks very much for the kind invitation and for the introduction. Let's share my screen. Can everyone see the shared screen? Hello? No, not yet. <laughs> no, sorry. Not yet, okay.
Are they up on your screen, Derek? Yes, they are. But they're not here. So uh, not sure what to do about that. Let's see. Shall I escape and try share again? Yeah, that would be good. Share screen again. Okay, share. Oh, there we go. Yep. Okay. So now the presenter. Part. How's that? That's perfect. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Alrighty. So, um, as Cindy mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, a new method that we developed in in collaboration with Shana Kelly's lab in Toronto to. Uh, uh, purify uh, retinal stem cells using a microfluidic magnetic uh, sorting procedure. Uh, and what that has told us about the uh, quiescence of adult stem cells in the retina. Now, there was no particular reason to think that there would be a stem cell in the retina uh, because the retina doesn't repair itself in the adult. Uh, unlike classic stem cell systems in the blood or the intestine or the skin, where there's a constant turnover of cells and the stem cells are constantly being activated to produce new cells, uh, there doesn't seem to be any ongoing adult proliferation in the adult retina. And so there was no particular reason to think there would be uh, a stem cell there. Uh, but through uh, uh, the work of a number of people in our lab, including uh, Brenda Coles, who is our lab, fantastic lab manager, uh, I'm going to talk about some of those experiments. Now, in all vertebrate eyes that have been studied so far, let me just move on here. Uh, this is a picture of the human eye, but I'm going to use it as a uh, measure of, let me just see if I can use a laser pointer here. I'm going to use it as a, uh, a representative of all vertebrate eyes. Uh, and uh, light comes in through the cornea and the lens and is focused on the retina at the back of the eye. Um, and as I mentioned, during embryonic development, uh, all retinas that have been studied in vertebrates develop from the center to the periphery. And what I mean by that is the first cells uh, in the eye to become postmitotic and the neural retina to become postmitotic are in the center part of the retina around the optic nerve. And the proliferating cells gradually, as development proceeds, move more and more peripherally on both sides, of, on all around the eye. In mammals, including mice and humans, uh, proliferation stops uh, in the retina, in this peripheral retinal region, uh, around uh, uh, the first postnatal week, postnatal late 10, it's basically over in mouse. However, in some non-mammalian vertebrates, uh, in, in some fish and amphibians that have been studied, proliferation continues in this peripheral uh, region of the retina throughout life. And there's a constant addition of new cells, new photoreceptors, to the uh, eyes of uh, some fish and amphibians. So there's two ways of seeing, of explaining this difference between mammalian retina development and non-mammalian vertebrate retina development. One is to say in mammals, the stem cells in the early postnatal period go quiescent. And the other possibility is that uh, they die or they differentiate into a, uh, a photoreceptor. I'm going to suggest and, and to give you evidence that, that what happens is those stem cells are still present in mammalian eyes in the peripheral region, this region of the ciliary margin that I'm outlining now, uh, but they're completely quiescent. Uh, and in fact, we can isolate uh, stem cells from the eye of 80-year-old humans as long as we get their eyes within 20 more, 24 hours post-mortem. And 80-year-old uh, humans have roughly the same number of stem cells present in their eye, around 10,000, that a child who dies uh, at, in the first year of life uh, has. Now, I mentioned that uh, uh, stem cells seem to be located in mouse and in human in this peripheral ciliary margin region, including what's called the pars plana, where it's uh, the retina shrinks down to a couple of layers, and uh, the ciliary margin where uh, some pigmented cells overlie uh, the ciliary muscles that control lens accommodation. So this whole region is called the ciliary margin. This is the area where in amphibians and fish, there's continued proliferation. And in mammals, uh, uh, we've shown that there are some uh, stem cells that are present. So we dissociated the, uh, all the different bits of the retina and looked for where cells would proliferate. And the only place in the adult retina where we could get proliferating cells was from the ciliary margin region. 
The cells that proliferated were pigmented cells, heavily pigmented cells. They proliferate clonally to provide, to proliferate into these clonal spheres that by seven days uh, included seven, several thousand cells. And you can see these, by seven days, these spheres of cells that came from a single retinal stem cell, the proliferation of a single retinal stem cell, some of them are pigmented and some of them are non-pigmented uh, cells. The pigmented cells are of two types. Most of them are retinal pigment epithelial progenitors, and these are the cells at the very back of the eye that absorb light so it's not reflected black and muddied our, vi muddied our vision. But a small number of the pigmented cells are actually retinal stem cells. So if you dissociate these spheres after seven days or two weeks, uh, maybe six to 10 of those most heavily pigmented cells will form secondary spheres, just like the primary spheres. And you can passage these uh, indefinitely uh, over time. The non-pigmented cells uh, will differentiate into all the different types of cells in the neural retina, the photoreceptors, the rod and code photoreceptors, the endocrines, the bipolars, the retinal ganglion cells. And so at least in vitro, these pigmented sphere forming cells meet the two criteria for stem cells. One is they show self-renewal in that you can dissociate these spheres and secondary and tertiary and quaternary spheres will develop. And second, they seem to produce all of the cell types of the neural retina and the RPE uh, from the proliferation of a single cell. So they seem to meet the stem cell criteria. Okay. Now I should say that these cells are among the easiest cells to grow in culture, uh, whether they're from adult mouse or adult human dissociations. Uh, and by easy, I mean, they don't require any growth factors. So you can just put them in essentially water, not water, but uh, essential amino acids, glucose, and uh, salts, uh, and they'll proliferate once you get them away from their normal environment, their normal niche. Uh, FGF2 uh, helps them proliferate, uh, but it turns out they make their own FGF. The stem cells will release FGF that acts in an autocrine manner on themselves to encourage some proliferation, uh, but we have to add higher concentrations of, of FGF2 to get maximal proliferation. But this idea that these cells are very easy to, will proliferate very easily, uh, made us think about, well, why are they not proliferating at all in the adult mouse and human retina? And uh, the suggestion that we, hypothesis that we came up with was that they're suppressed by their niche. So niche factors in the eye after the early uh, post, postnatal period uh, shut down the proliferation of the retinal stem cells and keep them quiescent for the rest of the animal's life, and in humans, this can be up to 100 years, keeps them quiescent. So it suggests that there were factors in the eye that uh, were suppressing the proliferation of, uh, of, of retinal stem cells. And so uh, two postdocs in the laboratory tried to ask, well, what were those factors and where were they coming from in the eye? And this is the work of Carl Wonders and Laurent Balance. And uh, what Carl and, and Laurent did was to take uh, single retinal stem cells isolated from uh, adult mouse eyes and co-culture them with other bits of the eye. So they could co-culture them with the ciliary margin region, with the mature uh, central retina, with the lens and the cornea, all the different parts of the eye. And, it, and the surprising result was that the proliferation of retinal stem cells in culture wasn't suppressed by nearby cells in the ciliary epithelium or in the retina but rather by cells in the lens and the cornea of the eye, at the front of the eye. And uh, what Laurent and Carl did was to show that if you big hunk of lens and cornea would suppress the proliferation of retinal stem cells uh, in vitro. And uh, they asked, well, if we know that retinal stem cells stop proliferating at just around postnatal day 10 in the adult moci, what turns on in the lens and the cornea at about postnatal day 10, that could be the thing that suppressed the proliferation of adult retinal stem cells. And uh, the candidates that we came up with were uh, the bone morphogenic proteins, number two and four, and a, a protein called serum frizzled related protein two, which is a Wnt pathway antagonist that turn on just around postnatal day 10. And what Laurent and Carl were able to show is you could take single retinal stem cells and expose them to BMP2 or 4 or to serum frizzle related protein 2, and that would completely stop the proliferation of those retinal stem cells in culture under baseline conditions. 
Moreover, they showed that if you if you took antagonists of BMP, like the uh, noggin, which is a BMP antagonist, binds to the BMP, prevents it from acting on this receptor, or a, a function blocking antibody against serum frizzle related protein two, you could get the retinal stem cells to proliferate even in the presence of lens and cornea cells if you put in those antagonists of BMPs and serum frizzle related protein two. So this suggested that uh, these factors uh, could account for the suppression, factors released by the lens and cornea could, could account for the suppression of adult retinal stem cells in the adult most natural human. More recently, Ken Grise has shown that you can also get this to work in vivo. So we, tried, we started out by putting in known growth factors that, that help proliferation in the retina, like fibroblast growth factor and insulin-like uh, growth factor. And they didn't do anything to the ciliary margin cells. But if we mixed those two positive proliferation factors, fibroblast growth factor and insulin-like growth factor, with noggin and the serum antibody against serum frizzle-related protein, then the combination of fins could produce a lot of proliferation in this ciliary margin uh, where the retinal stem cells are located in the adult moci. Uh, the, the growth factors, FGF2 and insulin-like growth factors themselves did nothing. You had to block the inhibitory signals with noggin and serum frozen protein before the, the fibroblast growth factor and insulin would start to get these cells to proliferate. So what you see here are uh, some cells that are labeled in TD tomato, and these are labeled by uh, an inducible promoter for MSX1 that Michelle Cayouette in Montreal and Toronto uh, showed was a, a very good marker of the ciliary epithelial cells. And so uh, with tamoxifen, because it's inducible, tamoxifen can induce um, uh, expression of TD tomato in about 30 or 40% of the cells in the ciliary margin surface cells. Uh, and in the presence of fins, fibroblast growth factor, insulin, noggin, and serum frizzle-related protein antibody, we can also show some of these cells would proliferate. And you can see uh, the arrows pointing to cells that are labeled both with EDU and MSX1. Now, Ken Grise was able to show that in vivo, once you've got these cells proliferating, a small number of them would actually migrate from the ciliary margin out into the neural retina. And here's a picture of one very nice cell uh, that seems to have taken on the morphology of a rod photoreceptor. So this is a cell that proliferated in the ciliary epithelium, migrated into the adult retina, and seemed to take on the phenotype of a rod photoreceptor. And so we're currently collaborating with a, a company in Switzerland, Endogenous Therapeutics, to try and see if we can find ways to better activate these retinal stem cells and get them to differentiate into uh, photoreceptors in the eyes of, uh, of people who are, have lost their, their photoreceptors. Okay, so we, we know a little bit about what controls, what factors are important for inducing quiescence in retinal stem cells based on the work of uh, Brenda and Lauren and, and, and uh, Carl. However, if we want to know intrinsically what, what's keeping the, the stem cells uh, suppressed in terms of their proliferation, uh, then we had to better purify uh, retinal stem cells. And uh, what we did was to collaborate with Shana Kelly's lab, as I mentioned, and particularly with Mahmoud uh, Labib, who was a postdoctoral fellow in Shana's lab. Uh, and what they developed was a, uh, a neat microfluidic technique uh, using magnets to um, uh, cause the sorting of cells. So the cells came in one end um, and uh, the cells were treated with uh, uh, an, a biotinylated antibodies or biotinylated antibodies to various cell surface proteins. And then they used um, uh, um, nickel coated, uh, avidin coated nickel nanoparticles uh, to uh, uh, help sort the cells. And uh, along with a nickel uh, uh, micromagnet or micromagnets, uh, what they were able to do is move the cells through the microfluidic device using a hairy bone structure that slowed the cells down so they had time to be uh, sorted. Uh, and uh, we could collect the cells in three uh, outlets, 
uh, where we were getting, uh, uh, by controlling the strength of the magnets, cells with high expression of cell surface proteins were interested in medium or low levels of, uh, of expression. And then finally, uh, uh, cells with other cells that had no um, uh, nickel on them and had no uh, expression of the cell surface proteins we're interested in would go out in the efflux. So we use this technique uh, and used it with a number of potential uh, uh, cell surface receptors that we think we thought might have been on retinal stem cell uh, stem cell surfaces. And so these are a number of things, and you can see some of them are obvious, like FGF2, uh, the BMP receptors, the uh, frizzled one receptor notch. Uh, and it turns out that all of these ones showed some enrichment of the frequency of sphere formation uh, in uh, going through the microfluidic device. But the three that were best were an ABC uh, transporter, notch one and frizzled one. And if we combine these three antibodies and our magnetic uh, microfluidic sorter, uh, we can get uh, uh, cells that were expressing medium or high, medium and low levels of these three receptors. And we could enrich by uh, uh, a huge number, a huge fold increase in the enrichment of those retinal stem cells, such that uh, we think that one in three cells after this enrichment were retinal stem cells. So it's not a complete purification, but it's a really good enrichment. And one of the more surprising things we found is that we compared this microfluidic device with our normal fact sorting. And we had not had great luck with fact sorting of the retinal stem cells. And the reason was very few of them uh, survived going through the fax machine. And so the viability of the number of sphere, clonal sphere forming cells that went into the um, uh, fax order versus how many come out were decreased by over 90%. However, with the microfluidic sorting device, it was much less stressful for the cells and we could recover 75 or 80% of the uh, retinal stem cells, sphere forming cells that went in could be recovered uh, after they went out. And it's important to note that, that none of the retinal stem cells were present in the effluent. It's meant that the combination of these antibodies uh, meant that we could uh, uh, capture almost all of the retinal stem cells with these three cell surface antibodies. So what did this allow us to do? Well, this allowed us, this purification allowed us to do single cell RNA sequencing on the retinal stem cells in order to better characterize them. And this is our our sorted population. Uh, and this is the uh, Tisney cluster analysis uh, showing uh, five different, significantly different clusters of cells. And the first thing we realized from this is that our, our dissections weren't as clean as we thought they were. We were getting uh, some trabecular meshwork cells. These, these are the cells that absorb the aqueous humor from the eye. We're getting some non uh, stem cells in the cellular epithelium, and we're getting some cells in the cornea and the limbus. Uh, uh, the limbus of the cornea. But we got two clusters, cluster two and cluster four, that seem to be expressing of all the markers that we'd think would be in retinal stem cells. Cluster two seemed to be primarily quiescent cells. So even in culture, very few of them would proliferate. Whereas cluster four were, were cells that would, in culture, would proliferate quite nicely into spheres. So we think we, we'd captured two populations, one that's much more quiescent and one that's at least in, in vitro is more active and more primed to proliferate. If we resorted, did a resorting of just clusters two and four, what we found is that uh, cluster two, this is the resort, we, we found three significant clusters. This is the quiescent cluster of retinal stem cells we suggest. This is the more likely to proliferate or in culture population. And there was a subcluster that we imagined, that we hypothesized, were quiescent cells moving in to become more proliferative. So what could we do with this information? Well, one thing we could do is to take some of the genes that were highly expressed in retinal stem cells and ask, could we find some novel cell surface genes that would allow us to repurify the retinal stem cells? And the answer was yes, using, using again the, the magnetic microfluidic device and four uh, molecules that we found either present for cell surface receptors that we found present in either cluster two or cluster four of the retinal stem cells. 
we included a, a cannabinoid receptor that was big in cluster two, the quiescent retinal stem cell population, uh, a metapotrophic glutamate receptor that was present in the more active proliferating cluster four population, and two other uh, cell surface proteins that were uh, present in both cluster two and cluster four. And again, by using high expression of all four of these markers, we could get uh, uh, an incredible enrichment of uh, the purification of uh, retinal stem cells, such that we think we're getting one in two or one in three of those cells. And so I think this sort of uh, is a way to validate uh, the magnetic uh, uh, microfluidic cell sorting is that we could pick up some novel cell service receptors that allowed us to even better purify the retinal stem cells. So looking just in, in to give a little taste of what we've been doing lately, and this is the work of Brenda Coles again, uh, looking at genes that were not cell surface, but uh, uh, genes that present intercellular genes that were present selectively in uh, the retinal stem cell cultures. Uh, we found that CREB1 uh, was present both in cluster one, cluster two and in cluster four. And uh, we tried to do loss of function approaches, both uh, with a homozygous hypomorph mutant uh, and with a small interfering RNA against CREB1. And we found in both cases, we lost about 50% of the retinal stem cells in the adult mouse, either through a mutation or by treating with siRNA in vitro. Now, we don't really know what's happening, whether the CREB is, with the lack of CREB, is driving these cells into quiescence or actually causing them to differentiate or causing them to uh, uh, die. Um, uh, but we think we have a, a good way to test that and tell you about that in the next slide. And uh, in the final slide is to uh, uh, look at one other gene that was one of our most highly enriched in cluster two in the quiescent retinal stem cell population. Uh, and this is a, 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 the cannabinoid receptor number one. Um, that was highly expressed in the quiescent retinal stem cells. And what Brenda did was take uh, uh, small interfering RNAs against this uh, cannabinoid receptor or against a non-targeting control with a non-targeting control and show that when we treated cluster two cells, these are the quiescent retinal stem cells with, an, with a, a knockdown of, of, of uh, the cannabinoid receptor number one, we got a 400-fold increase in the number of sphere-forming cells. So we interpret this as saying that we're relieving the inhibitory break on the retinal stem cells to proliferate and getting a much higher number of the ones in the quiescent clusters to start proliferating. And some of those, we think, are moving into the proliferating population. So not only are some of them staying in this population, but other ones are actually transitioning to cause an increase in the number of cells in the actively proliferating population because we've removed the brick. So this is just an initial study using one of the most highly enriched genes in the quiescent retinal stem cell population. But what I think it's shown is that we can learn something not only about the extrinsic control of quiescence in adult retinal stem cells in mouse and humans through the work on factors released from the lens of the cornea, but also some of the intrinsic factors in the retinal stem cells themselves that are keeping them uh, uh, deeply quiescent uh, in the adult. And as I mentioned before, uh, we think these uh, uh, retinal stem cells are becoming quiescent in the early postnatal period in all mammals that we've studied so far, uh, including uh, still keeping those cells uh, quiescent in vivo in 80 year olds. Uh, we hope that by uh, relieving those inhibitory signals, either intracellularly or extracellularly, we may be able to get more of those retinal stem cells in vivo to proliferate, to reactivate and reproliferate, and perhaps make new retinal cells that are lost in, to disease or mutation, and potentially could be, uh, in the long term, a new treatment for blindness. So thanks very much for your attention. I hope I haven't gone too long, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Derek. No, you didn't go too long, um, as usual. Uh, perfect timing. We have some time for questions. If people have any questions, please put them into the Q&A uh, button below. I do know that uh, one question was put into the chat, so I'll just ask that now. Um, the question was, how did you identify your initial candidates of molecules before you found out they were the BMPs? 
Yeah, so we looked for uh, expression profiles in the lens and the cornea over development. And so we, we know that the retinal stem cells stop proliferating at postnatal late 10 in the adult mouse, not sorry, in the postnatal late 10 in the early postnatal mouse. So we looked at expression profiles of genes that turned on around that time at the end of the first postnatal week in lens and cornea. And there were a number of candidates, uh, but because of other uh, experiments, the fact that BMP caused suppression of proliferation of brain stem cells, we thought that BMPs were a, a good candidate and anything that involved the wind, wind, the wind path, we would be a good candidate too. So then we tested those ones. So we had a bigger selection of genes that were turning on at the time that the retinal stem cells stopped proliferating. So a little bit of serendipity attached to the idea that you were looking through development. That's yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I, I had a question. So one of the things that uh, I noticed was that you had very exciting actually the idea that you can stimulate the neuroepithelium no the, yeah the epithelium and then get those new cells to maybe migrate out do you worry that that's really about you know one of the more prominent things that have has been shown in the retina material transfer now that you have the td tomato a high expression of that protein and people have shown that there's nanotubes that will you know allow cells to to connect between you know and transfer the material do you think that like do you, is there any other way that you've shown that migration or has it only been with the strong TV tomato labeling that could be material transfer? Yeah, I guess there, there's a couple of answers. One is that we can just look at the EDU population. Mm -hmm. So the BRDU or EDU population that starts in the ciliary margin, some of those labeled cells, EDU labeled cells, also move out into the peripheral retina. So uh, that can't be due to material transfer because those are, well, could be material transfer, but I think it's unlikely those are due to material transfer. The other thing is the material transfer is primarily between photoreceptors, photoreceptor to photoreceptor. And in fact, there's no good evidence that there's transfer from a progenitor cell, a retinal progenitor cell or a stem cell from a photoreceptor. It's still possible, but there's no evidence that that's true. So far, all of the transfer in the retina has been between photoreceptors. Okay, great, okay. Well, thank you very much. That was, a, that was great. Uh, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is, uh, let me get my introductory notes now. Okay. So our next talk is from uh, Dr. Shuelong Zhang. Um, he's on our screen now. He's coming to us from uh, another time zone. So we really appreciate his participation. Uh, Dr. Zhang completed his PhD at the Institute of Photonics at the University of Strathclyde in the UK, and he went on to do a postdoctoral fellowships at the University of Glasgow and the University of Toronto. He was developing optoelectronic systems for biomedical applications. In 2021, Dr. Zhang joined the Beijing Institute of Technology at the Beijing Advanced Innovation Center for Intelligent Robots and Systems, where, is he, where he's currently advancing his research. We welcome Dr. Zhang and look forward to your talk entitled Optoelectronic Microrobots for Cell Manipulation and Medicine. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So can you hear me, Cindy? Yes. Okay, you I'm going to share my screen. Now. Great. Yeah. Okay, Cindy, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see it. Thank you. Okay, wait a moment. Um, uh, can you see my changing the screen? Yes, it's working. Okay, uh, I'm going to begin. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shui Long Zhang. I feel really honored today to be invited to give a presentation on my research. And the title of my research is Optoelectronic uh, Microrobots for Cell Manipulation and Medicine. Um, so uh, probably you know that the 2000, 2000, uh, 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics uh, was awarded to Professor Ash Asking uh, for the invention of optical tweezers and their applications in biological systems. So optical tweezers is using laser light beam uh, to control tiny small objects such as cells, uh, virus, 
and nanoparticles. Um, uh, so it's, it's a great invention and inspired by optical traders. Uh, my supervisor, supervisor at UC Berkeley uh, invented a related technology called optoelectronic traders, which is a similar technology, but use light uh, to induce non-uniform non electrical field for the manipulation uh, of microparticles. So here is a video showing how we can use light to move uh, tiny small objects such as uh, micro beads. As you can see here by shining a, a light pattern uh, onto a, a silicon substrate, we can create non-uniform electrical field and pattern these microparticles um, such as cells or dielectric beads into sp uh, specific uh, macro patterns. And of course, uh, using programmable light patterns, uh, we can make uh, these macro particles to move. And um, so as you can see here, uh, you can use, uh, it's very easy to generate uh, different light patterns. It's very, it's very easy to program these light patterns. So it allows us to uh, have the capability to control uh, micro scale or nano scale ob objects uh, at will. So how does this device work? So our device consists of a top plate, which is ITO coated glass and the bottom plate, which is ITO coated glass as well. And, but on top of the ITO layer, there's an additional layer of amorphous silicon, which is a photoconductive layer. And ITO is a transparent conductor. So by applying electrical field between the two, we will have uniform electrical field across the two plates. And in this case, the device function like a capacitor, but by shining light to the photoconductive layer, this uh, amorphous silicon absorbs light and its electric conductivity changes. So it behaves from a, a, a insulator to conductor. And in this case, the illuminated area will become a, a virtual electrode. And in this case, we'll generate a non-uniform electrical field around this virtual electric field. And this non-uniform electric field uh, interact with the micro objects in the system and then generate the manipulation force. And by moving the light pattern, we can move this localized non-uniform electrical field. Then we can move the particles uh, that interact with this non-uniform electrical field. And here is what our devices look like. And compared with optical traders, we do not need to have laser beam or coherent light source. And the power density we use is much lower. So here are some examples of using optical traders to move uh, micro particles uh, to control their position and also use the uh, optoelectronic traders uh, uh, to uh, patterning liver cells into desired patterns. And of course, some work that I did in, in University of Glasgow is using this tech technology to assemble uh, conductive uh, metallic beads to form uh, electronic circuits. And of course, in combination with Microfluidic technology, uh, we can do uh, cell sorting or microparticle sorting uh, uh, in the microfluidic channel. As you can see here at the, the bottom right uh, uh, video, that the light pattern can change the direction of the, of the particles. So this technology uh, really uh, gives us capability to control micro objects uh, at will. So here enters my uh, first part, which is uh, the light driven micro robot. So based on the optoelectronic tracer technology that I introduced uh, here at uh, University of Toronto, working with my supervisor, Aaron Villar and uh, Mohammed, uh, we developed uh, the gear shift macro robot and box shift macro robot and space shift macro robot. So these macro robots are fabricated using uh, SU8 and using standard photolithography techniques. Uh, we can use LED pattern to match the layout of the macro robot to provide driving force and the unique properties here is that they are a large artificial micro tools and their mechanical structures can be easily redesigned and optical control system can be easily adjusted to provide the, the driving force. And compared with using optical tweeters, the micro robots we manipulate here are much larger. So one particularly uh, application here is that we can use a micro robot to load, transport and deliver a payload. And compared with directly using the light pattern to move the, uh, uh, to move the objects. So the micro robot can exert a stronger manipulation force, allowing the payload to have a higher linear velocity uh, in our system. And of course, the piece of art here is that we can do parallel control of multiple 
micro robots uh, with different payloads uh, loaded inside. And, and uh, this really uh, expands the multifunction uh, of this micro robotic uh, technology. Uh, apart, apart from using uh, dielectric beads as payloads, we turn ROI to use a micro robot to catch and deliver a single cell from a cell mixture uh, to a fixed micro well. And then we can do cell culture and clonal expansion. So uh, it's like a cell picker. So allow us to pick a, a single cell from a crowded environment and then to do a cell culture and clonal expansion. And this technique is also uh, uh, allow us to select, transport, or deliver one or few cells to micro wells. And then we can do cell culture and cell adhesion. And also the system is uh, compatible with cell lysis, uh, allows us to do MRI capture, CDNA syn uh, synthesize, whole genome amplification, and RNA sequencing. Apart from uh, the application at a, at a single cell uh, sorting and single cell uh, culture, uh, the system can also be used for cell fusion. Uh, so as you can see here, we can use a robot to catch two or three uh, uh, different cells, uh, cells of same species or cells of different species. Uh, by applying uh, DC pulses, uh, we can do a cell fusion uh, of the same type, which is homotypic fusion or cell fusion of different types, which is heterotypic fusion. Another uh, important application here is that we can use this micro robot to select and isolate precious payloads from heterogeneous mixtures. For example, we can use a micro robot to navigate through a maze of debris, which can be a mice brain uh, primary dissection consisting of dead cells, aggregates, and cell fragments. Uh, we can use this micro robot to collect neurospheres uh, from these uh, primary mouse brain dissection. So the micro robot is controlled by a joystick to navigate through this, uh, uh, through this maze of debris and allow us to harvest these important neurospheres, uh, which are known to be useful for regenerative medicine and treatment. Uh, of course, uh, based on this work, uh, Aaron and uh, fantastic collaborators at the University of College London, we are working under this, uh, uh, under this uh, uh, project, uh, try to develop a micro-robotic system for automatic neural stem cell extraction and analysis. So I be believe my colleagues here will introduce more of their uh, great work uh, at a later stage. It's all about my presentation. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my supervisor, Professor Aaron Wheeler, and the whole Wheeler group members, uh, Mohammed, Erika, and Jashi, and also the support from uh, Zensra group, and Moshat group, and another Karanis group at the University of Toronto. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Shrelong. That was excellent. It's very interesting. Um, I encourage people to put, we have time for questions. So people like to put their questions into the uh, Q&A. We have, I have, a, I have a, a comment here. Fascinating talk. Thanks, Shrelong. Okay, uh, I think we'll move on to our next speaker then. Um, I'm Happy to uh, introduce our next speaker, Phil Stojic. Phil began his uh, research career in machine learning and brain computation, brain computer interfaces at the University of Toronto. And he's now a PhD student in the Morsehead Lab. Uh, he's researching neural stem cells and their interaction with a niche and the implications for neural regeneration. So with that, uh, Phil, maybe you could share your slides. Hi. Great. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Phil Stoich, uh, and as Sidi mentioned, I'm a PhD student in her lab researching neural stem cells. And uh, today I'd like to tell you a little bit about harnessing the potential of these very rare stem cells for neural regeneration. Let me just get my laser pointer. Okay. So Derek has already introduced stem cells, so I won't spend too much time explaining them but in essence, they are the building blocks of the body and the organs therein. And as such, they are aptly named stem cells. They have two specific characteristics, self-renewal and the ability to generate all the cell types that comprise a mature organ, including the central nervous system. 
these two properties are unique to stem cells. And those properties are also why they make stem cells so valuable as tools in regenerative medicine. If they are harbored in specific organs, they actually provide a means to repair damage by replacing lost cells. Now, stem cells are abundant in the brain during development, but as one of the pioneers of modern neuroscience, Ramoni Cajal said over a century ago, once the development was ended, the founts of growth and regeneration of the axons and dendrites dried up irrevocably. In the adult centers, the nerve paths are something fixed, ended, and immutable. Everything may die, nothing may be regenerated. It is for the science of the future to change, if possible, this harsh decree. So the developed brain is static. The source of growth and regeneration in the brain during development just disappears once the, fin the brain finishes maturing. For a very long time, this was a central dogma to neuroscience. The brain just isn't regenerative. It has no way of producing new neurons or other mature neural cell types. And the part of the reason for this dogma was that in the adult, there was no clear evidence for the presence of neural stem cells. But in the 60s, a small group of scientists began challenging this dogma, and they found that there were, in fact, some kind of very, very rare cells that could multiply in the adult mammalian brain. Now, there wasn't enough evidence to say these were stem cells, but the findings were built on by others in the 70s and 80s. Then finally, in 1992, two scientists found that they weren't just any multiplying cells. They were, in fact, bona fide neural stem cells in the adult mammalian brain. They showed the unique properties of stem cells to self-renew and make all the cells of the brain. So the dogma was broken, and it turned out the brain did have some regenerative potential from a very, very rare population of cells. These cells were always there, but because they were so rare, they were just difficult to see, difficult to identify, and hard to isolate. So why are we interested in stem cells? It is a really simple ac answer, actually. Um, central nervous system disease and injury is extremely prevalent. It imposes a heavy economic and social burden on society. For example, for stroke alone, there are over 80 million survivors worldwide and 50 million with long-term disability. The direct medical cost is $185 billion a year and average hospital stay is six and a half days. The global burden of disease will only increase with an aging population and conditions like traumatic brain injury and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's are projected to be among the most common conditions affecting Canadians by 2031. Most importantly, there is no cure, only care. There are treatments for brain injury, for example, that need to be given right away to prevent further organ damage, and there's therapy to return some cognitive, motor, and verbal functions, but tissue that is damaged remains so, and quality of life is often significantly reduced. Therein lies a serious need for regenerative therapeutics, and so the appeal of neural stem cells becomes clear. Since the discovery of neural stem cells, efforts have been made to characterize them, what areas they're found in, and how they behave. Now, a lot of this work was done in rodents, but work was also done in other species and humans too. The most prominent source of neural stem cells is found in the front part of the brain, lining fluid-filled chambers called the lateral ventricles, these black triangles here, in a region termed the subependymal or subventricular zone, or SVZ, that you can see here in blue. In rodents, under baseline conditions, neural stem cells from this region will multiply, they'll produce cells that migrate to a site of the brain involved in olfaction, where they turn into neurons. So even though these incredible cells are rare, they can multiply, they can produce multiple types of brain cells, they can migrate, and they can contribute to important brain functions, making them an incredible source of regenerative potential following injury. Now, one of the reasons the brain becomes less regenerative over time and thus has less capacity for repair in adulthood is that the already very rare neural stem cells slowly decline in number and proliferative capacity, at least in the brain. Something that's very interesting, however, is that neural stem cells aren't found in isolation in the SVZ, but are surrounded by a multitude of other cell types in a well-packed region depicted here that can actually influence the behavior of neural stem cells. The cells altogether constitute the neurogenic environment or neural cell, cell niche, which is really, really small. It's only a few cells in width, spanning tens of microns, and neural stem cells only comprise fewer than 5% of cells here. So even within the neurogenic niche, neural stem cells are rare. What's interesting is that this niche changes with age, and research from our lab has shown that it's the niches of the neural stem cells that influence their capacity to proliferate, rather than the cells themselves losing any inherent potential. We know this because when we expose old neural stem cells to young niches, we can actually see them 
uh, proliferate and multiply like crazy. So to understand neural stem cells better, we want to find ways to isolate the neural stem cells away from these niche effects. So if we have neural stem cells and our brains create new neurons throughout life, how is it that we have devastating and seemingly irreversible damage still? Well, research from our lab and others have found that a small number of cells from the SVZ will actually migrate to sites of injury, shown here in red, and merge with the scar tissue, shown here in green, or start to become neurons, but then die off. So the SVZ sends cells to contribute to the injury, but it's just not enough. We have ways of increasing the response to injury through drugs. Our lab has found certain exposure to certain drugs like metformin, the diabetes drug, can enhance neural stem cell proliferation and pushes cells to become neurons and actually can promote recovery following injury. We also uh, can enhance their migration capacity with other techniques like electrical stimulation. And we know that neural stem cells transplanted directly into the site of injury can also promote tissue repair and functional recovery. So neural stem cells have potential for regenerative therapy and we have ways to help them along, but no treatment perfectly repairs the injury site yet. So we can see their potential and we just need to optimize their capacity for therapeutic intervention. And to find the best ways to do this, we really need the right tools to isolate just neural stem cells so we can properly study them and discern what makes them tick. So what are the current ways we try to isolate neural stem cells from the brain? First, we need to physically separate the SVC niche from the rest of the brain. To do this, we rely on human technical skill with small pointy knives. In this video that you'll see shortly, I have a slab of brain tissue about eight millimeters across, and the two holes in the middle are the lateral ventricles, and my goal is to cut out the thinnest sliver lining them, which contains the SVZ. As you can see, there is a fair bit of fine motor control required to cut out the region, and in this process, I'm taking out each individual side of the SVZ. However, the resulting dissected tissue ends up being on the scale of hundreds of microns thick rather than the ideal tens of microns. So the majority of the cells we collect are actually not the immediate neural stem cell niche. And in addition to this, the tissue isolation is done by eye and will have both intra-user and intra-user variabilities. Lastly, this step is time consuming and can take up to half an hour during which cells are dying. So there is a need for a technology that has the capacity for enhanced accuracy where tissue sections tens of microns thick can be isolated where variability is reduced and where speed is increased. And we are currently in collaboration with some wonderful people at Wheel in the Wheeler Lab and UCL's Touch Lab, as well as George Wire from the Surgical Robot Vision Group at UCL to try and make this dream a reality with an automated micro resector, which you can see here on the right. Now in this system, we place a brain slab on a rotating platform and a computer identifies where the SVC is, then makes a series of pinpoint accurate cuts with knives seen here to try and isolate it. Once we collect the SVC tissue, how is it that we actually separate neural stem cells from the rest of the cells? Well, in our human approach, once we isolate the slivers of tissue, we can homogenize them into a single cell suspension and plate them in a dish in vitro in uh, the presence of certain growth factors to spur neural stem cell proliferation. So over the course of several days, each neural stem cell will multiply. It'll keep multiplying, proliferating while remaining attached to one another, eventually forming this floating colony of cells called the neurosphere, which you can see here. The niche cells, like this one stuck here at the bottom, don't do this. So we can collect the spheres to study neural stem cells in isolation and analyze them, treat them, transplant them, and so on. But I hope that you can appreciate that this approach only lets us know which cell is a stem cell after the fact. In this regard, this is a retrospective assay in identifying neural stem cells. Another method of isolating neural stem cells uses a prospective approach. So in fluorescence activated cell sorting, cells of interest like neural stem cells are tagged with fluorescent markers, then passed through a machine that excites the markers with lasers and measures the fluorescence in order to separate uh, different types of cells. To tag the cells, antibodies against proteins unique to cells of interest are used, but there's no single antigen that's specific to neural stem cells. So a combination of markers are used. Unlike the neurosphere assay, FACS allows for prospective identification of neural stem cells, but it does have its own shortcomings. So it requires a high number of cells to be pooled in order to yield a sufficient amount of target cells. And as you'll recall, the SVZ is a very, very small region. So pooling cells together requires a lot of biological samples to be used, which means more time preparing cells and it means a lot more animal sacrifice. As you 
uh, as you can also imagine, the process of shooting lasers at cells, then funneling them through tiny tubes in liquid made from machines can be quite harsh. In fact, when we try to grow neural stem cells isolated from facts, they have a vastly reduced capacity to form neurospheres in the dish. On top of this, using fluorescent antibodies is a time-consuming and costly step that also results in some cell loss. And the entire process is quite labor-intensive. Now, what FACS does is actually two steps. The first one is identification of target cells, and the second is their isolation. So it's our hope to find a better way of doing these two steps in a way that avoids exposing cells to high pressures, puts them in media supportive of their survival without the need for antibodies and from a very small sample of cells. So first, we hope to collect a small amount of cells from the SVZ, put them in a dish like this. So what I have here is an image of SVZ cells in suspension under a microscope. And all the small circles you see, these little white dots, are uh, cells, including both neural stem cells and niche cells. They have little red arrows pointing at them. And our goal in this system is to teach an algorithm in an iterative approach, which blobs are neural stem cells identified with green check marks that will go on to form neurospheres, and which ones are niche cells, which are identified by red Xs. Once we successfully identify the right cells, the next step requires a delicate method to physically collect them and isolate them from other cells. And the progress we've made on this front is really exciting. So you'll hear more about it in another presentation in the second session. So I hope that my brief talk has given you some insight as to the need for better tools for neural stem cell isolation. Now these tools, which I've depicted here as golden tweezers for plucking out a neural stem cell are a requirement for the correct study and characterization of neural stem cells which is a prerequisite for us to create proper treatments for devastating brain injuries and disease and help repair the irreparable organ. It is in this way that neural stem cells can be realized as the future of regenerative medicine. Now, it might seem ambitious, but as Ramoni Cajal went on to say, inspired with high ideals, science must work to impede or moderate the gradual decay of neurons to overcome the almost invincible rigidity of their connections and to reestablish normal nerve paths when disease has severed centers that were intimately associated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil. That was great. A very nice, uh, really points out what's so important about doing all of these, acquiring these tools so we can ask these most important questions. Just looking at, uh, again, I encourage people to put their questions in the Q&A, um, but we have time for one question. and. I think I'll ask it. So um, one of the things that you sort of pointed out, which I think uh, there's some compelling evidence for is that the niche can control the behavior of the stem cells. But I was wondering if there's any compelling evidence that there's intrinsic properties in the stem cells that controls their behavior. Are they different? When you're doing the AI, will you be looking for different cells, say from males and females? Um, based on intrinsically different properties, sort of thinking back to Derek's idea of, you know, what's controlling their quiescence and activation. That's a really good question. And there are definitely techniques we can use uh, to identify cells, neural stem cells that are more activated or, or more quiescent. Um, and in terms of male versus female, I mean, I, I'm not sure, I can't think of any intrinsic differences, but there probably are some. Um, so an interesting approach would be to combine this with some sort of um, RNA sequencing um, after collecting male versus female neural stem cells, and then maybe we can use that. Um, but there are definitely intrinsic differences. We know that uh, at least within the SVZ, there's the three walls that I, I showed actually have uh, different intrinsic differences in neural stem cells that um, stem cells from different parts of each of these walls, when they go to the olfactory bulb, will actually create different types of neurons. So it would be really interesting if we could sort out those specific um, intrinsically different neural stem cells. Perhaps there's some that are, are better for uh, regeneration in certain injuries than others. Okay, great. Thank you. Lots to think about. And it's a lovely segue into our next speaker's talk, who's going to be using some of these tools. So I'm thrilled to be uh, in, uh, introducing our next speaker, um, Dr. Erica Scott. 
Erica obtained her PhD in molecular biology and in bioinformatics at the University of California, Davis, where she studied an equine neurodegenerative disease model. She then moved to the University of Toronto and began her postdoctoral fellowship in the biomedical engineering lab of Aaron Wheeler, where she has developed some single cell omic technology, which she's gonna to discuss today. Her focus on neuroregeneration and bioinformatics makes her a perfect fit for today's symposium. So with that, I welcome Erica and you can start sharing. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks Cindy for the introduction. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go through the different uh, technologies and different platforms that I've started to develop in the Wheeler Lab. Um, and lots of it has actually been driven uh, by this, um, that is need, I guess, for a platform that can be easily applicable to any organism. So I used to work on um, horses, which are semi-model organisms, and there wasn't enough technologies on them. So when I first moved to um, Toronto, I worked with Dr. Shua Long Zhang with optoelectronic tweezers, um, and that was for cells and suspension. And so what was important is that these were for selecting cells and then moving them based on certain markers like fluorescence. Next, what I looked at was um, the cells or cells that are invading into a 3D matrix. And this is called SIMS. And this was with uh, Dr. Betty Lee, who was a PhD student in the Wheeler lab at the time. And then lastly, it was DISCO. And this is what I'm really going to talk about today because I put in the most effort into this. And this is specifically for adherent cells and culture. And so I'm going to talk about the version one and also the version two that we've developed uh, that's for ex vivo tissue slices. Okay, so this DISCO version one. Um, what it consists of is you have the laser lysis in the setup, which you have an inverted microscope and the laser input is coming from below from a Q-switch laser. And the device supports a uh, very small volume cell culture. So sub microliter or around a microliter with the dimensions of 1.7 millimeters and, and 0.54 in height. And what's crucial for this, this version of DISCO or DISCO in general is that these cells have to adhere to this top plate, which means they have to survive, proliferate and, and actually stick to this glass plate. To isolate the cell, we use this laser assisted uh, cavitation bubble. So we use the energy from the laser to create this cavitation bubble and that expansion and collapsing of that bubble is actually what pops the cell off of this top plate. Now, when you pop the cell off the top plate, it gets, the cell lysate gets released into this liquid that's above uh, where these cells are cultured. And you use digital microfluidics to then collect and pretty much sweep across uh, this culture site so that you can collect that cell lysate. And what's important is that digital microflix offers for this uh, automated and iterative process of collection. So you use the laser to isolate the cell and use the digital microfluidic device to then collect that cell lysate, which you can do um, a variety of assays on downstream. Now, what I focus on mainly is actually the sequencing. So RNA sequencing um, of this plant, of these cells. And so for preliminary results, um, what we really hone in on for the sequencing is actually deep sequencing with a high gene count. So commercial platforms, you tend to get around 50,000 uh, 50, to 100,000 reads per cell. Um, and for these cells, a gene count of around 3,000. So you can see that we we really aim for deeper sequencing with higher genes. Um, and with more input, you, you will always see a higher um, amount of reads and gene count like you do with the bulk. Now, what we did was we looked at um, human and mouse can cancer cells just for specificity and sensitivity. So we looked at uh, mouse is in red here and green is, in, is human. And so we looked at individual cells um, in a pure population of just mouse cancer cells and then uh, mouse cancer cells in a mixed population of a human and mouse. 
And so you can see a clear separation of the cells coming from just a pure population versus a mixed. And if you looked at the individual cells, you could see that there was a difference in gene expression of these individual cells um, that were surrounded by human cells versus not. So then we went to apply this to uh, neural stem cells. And so these are the neurospheres that Phil was alluding to. And so we culture these neurospheres onto our top plates and we have to uh, get them to adhere to the top plate. So they have to, for about a day or two, you leave them on these top plates and incubator so they can adhere. And then we fix them and here we stain them for your GFAP and beta-3 and DAPI. Now we took uh, neural stem cells from an old mouse and from a younger mouse. And then we laser lysed uh, these cells with specific markers, such as the GFAP, which is typically for astrocytes and neural stem cells, and then beta-3 tubulin, which is typically for neuronal lineages. Now, just preliminarily, we started off with, um, we started off with doing somewhat of a standard curve for the proteomics. So we took a HeLa extract where we had a known concentration going in uh, and we detected the number of protein groups on the other end with mass spec. And the purple dots we see in the middle here are the individual neural stem cells and where they fall in this range of detection. And so it's promising to see that they're, they're not actually falling at the lower end, they're falling in the mid range, which, which is great for sensitivity reasons. Now, if you focus your attention more on the right, which is the LFQ intensity distributions, um, you can see that you actually see a consistent distribution uh, through the bulk, which is the red on the top, and the single cells, which is the yellow uh, here at the bottom. And so that was promising to us because that means that the variability that you're detecting between the samples uh, is likely more the biological uh, changes that you're gonna see. Now, when you compare the bulk proteomics versus the single cell proteomics, you do have an overlap of 701 proteins. And what these 701 proteins are is they, they tend to be the more robust, higher expressed proteins. And so you can see that even with the intensity that it, it has a higher and more consistent intensity, uh, especially in the bulk. Uh, and then you can appreciate that it's much more of an average of what you would see in this whole bulk sample, which um, in this case is actually a one sphere. And then in the individual cells, you see a bit of a dropout. And on the fringe of these, of this heat map or the heat, the proteins that are solely in the bulk or the singles, it tends to be these lower expressing proteins that actually complement what we found in the overlapping, um, overlapping proteins. So what I mean here is you'll have uh, the lower, lower expressed proteins um, of a certain pathway like folate synthesis or even um, transcription initiation kind of thing. So they're just like the lower expressed counterparts to what we found in the overlapping um, proteins. Okay, so the DISCO version two. So here we have an upright scope, the laser input is coming from the top and the laser input is actually um, a fiber optic laser input. And then we have a different fluorescence excitation. We use LEDs, so you have, it can switch really fast and actually it's the imaging quality on this is, is far superior to our last one. Um, again, you have that stage which has the integratable digital microfluidic um, compatibility and device. And you have the similar device in that you have this top plate that you're putting the tissue or mounting the tissue. And then you have a bottom plate which houses the electrodes that help or that uh, really drive the digital microfluidic movement of fluids. Okay, so what we do here is you start with uh, a cryopreserved tissue which you just preserve in isopentane and liquid nitrogen. You mount it onto this cryostat pedestal and what we do is we use a biopsy pen to get this exact dimension of two millimeter diameter circle. And so the reason why we do this is that's at least what I've optimized now for um, droplet collection. 
on this top plate. So this top plate has eight of these sites here to which you can mount this tissue. And each of these hydrophilic spots where we mount the tissue is, is two millimeters in diameter. Oops. Um, and so what we do is we put this biopsy pen directly into this uh, cryopreserved chunk and you just section it in 10 micron sections. And afterwards you get a great little circle that you can then just easily mount onto these top plates. Uh, and then squish it all together into the DMF device and start laser lysing. So what this looks like for the subventricular zone is this is actual a bright field image of that tissue in one of these uh, little wells that we have on the top plate. And you can stain it so you can see the DAPI and you can see there's the corpus callosum at the top here. And then you have those subventricular walls with that lateral medial and dorsal that, that Phil is mentioning. So the, you can then go on to stain. So here we stain for FOX3, one SOX2 and DAPI. And you can stain in order just to give you some pre-classification um, criteria for when you're selecting cells. And in this scenario, you're, you're just eyeballing essentially for that SVZ area and then you're creating that biopsy punch exactly uh, where that area is. And so then you just find the site and you can laser lice and then ob observe what it looks like afterwards. Oops. So what this looks like for preliminary results is that we've actually, uh, in our newest version of this DISCO2, we've compared it with commercial platforms. And so we've taken Visium, which is an array of capture sites over a tissue and gives you not single cell, but gives you the, this broad um, picture of molecular signatures. And then we also compared it with 10X Chromium, which is uh, a single cell platform, but you don't record any spatial data. So it's just the granularity of single cell. And then lastly, we use DISCO to give you, to record that spatial orientation, morphology characteristics, um, and also get that single cell granularity. And this was all to look at this stroke injury site. So specifically astrocytes in and out of this, this stroke injury site. So what I would like you to appreciate from this talk is the toolbox that we've generated for cell isolation in the Wheeler lab. And so it begins with OET, where you can isolate cells from a suspension, uh, and then SIMS, where you can isolate small batches of cells from a 3D matrix, and then DISCO version one, where we isolate individual cells from a 2D inherent culture, and then the version two, where you can isolate individual cells from an ex vivo tissue slice. And so with that, I'd love to thank uh, the Wheeler Lab, especially Dr. Michael Dryden, uh, Harrison Edwards, Mohammed Al Sayed, um, and Julian Lamana, and of course Aaron Wheeler, and then Dr. Cindy Morse Head for all the work in the the development of even the first version of Disco, and then Dr. Miriam Fiaz for some of the development of the second version of Disco. And that's all. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, wasn't waiting for you to say that. Just uh, a little <laughs> delayed getting to my mute button. Um, thank you so much. That was great, Erica. Um, are there any questions? We have time for one question before we're going to go to our break. Are there any questions for Erica? I'm just looking. I'm not very good at this uh, tool thing here. So, you know, those are a lot of different. It looks really, I don't know. It looks really hard to me to use all of those different tools in the version of uh, V2. I don't, how do you, are you trying to compare across all those domains or does each one just have its own story and that's all you're trying to sort of tell? Like I, I wasn't quite sure yeah. when, when you looked at, I think it was your slide nine, but you have mm -hmm. three different sets. Are those all telling you different things, different stories about stroke biology? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, the first one is really it's honing on honing in on the, the broader scale and really with the commercial platforms there because they're so high throughput you get just a lot like quantity of information. And so the way they all complement each other is actually the, the type or the quality of that information they give you and then a metadata that's attached to it, and so with the Visium the metadata that's really important is that spatial metadata. And then 
for the 10 X chromium, just the fact that it's, it's single cell is, is what gives, and it's high throughput and that you get, you know, thousands of cells from that mm -hmm. stroke area. Mm -hmm. um, whereas disco where it comes in is it, it is lower throughput, much lower throughput. And so let's say you collect 10 cells in the injury site and 10 out the, where you really see the benefits of disco is, is the fact that you can record all this metadata in terms of orientation in the tissue, uh, what neighbors it has, like cell neighbors it has directly around it or the morphology even. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, it's much more focused on the metadata aspect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay, so we're uh, right on schedule. Thanks to all the speakers for making sure we were we stayed on, on track. And I think we're now we're gonna take a, a break until 1035 when we'll get back with session two. So a few minute break and we'll see you at 1035. Thanks again to all the speakers. Okay, um, welcome to the second session of our symposium. Let's get started again. Um, so my name is Mike Shaw. Um, I work at UCL in the computer science department and also the Weiss Centre. Um, and I'll be chairing this session of the symposium. We've got again four fascinating looking talks, which are sp spanning this blend of novel engineering and application of the technologies for the diagnostics and manufacturing of uh, single cell based therapies. Um, so our first talk is being, and our keynote speaker for the session is Kasim Rafiq from UCL. So Kasim is an associate professor in cell and gene therapy bioprocess engineering in the Department of Biomedical Engineering at UCL. He's a multidisciplinary engineer working at the life science engineering and commercial interfaces with a focus on bioprocessing automation and biomanufacture of cell and gene-based therapies. And he currently leads a large research portfolio and also an interdisciplinary research group that collaborates internationally with academic institutions and industry partners and clinicians. Kasim is a chartered engineer and chartered scientist and sits on multiple scientific and engineering committees, including the ICHEME Biochemical Engineering Subject Interest Group, British Standards Institute Biotechnology Committee, and the BIA Cell and Gene Therapy Advisory Committee. And Kasim is going to be talking to us today about automated bioprocessing and manufacturing strategies for the production of human stem cells. So I'll hand over to you. Great, I can see your talk. So off, off you go, Kasim. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mike, for the introduction and, and many thanks to the organizers for uh, the invitation to speak at this meeting. So my talk will be slightly different to, from what you've heard previously, where the focus of, of my research and the work that we do is very much on the kind of the larger scale end. So looking at how we can start to manufacture these cells, in particular stem cells and, and other cell types of interest for the use of therapeutic purposes, so developing what we call cell or gene based therapies. So to begin, what I'd like to do is just give a brief overview of what I'll be covering. So just giving some of the context of uh, human mesenchymal stem st stromal cell manufacture, uh, a bit of an overview of some of the challenges we have around consistency driven development and why it's important for the work that we do. And then looking at some of the automated approaches that we have established or developed to try and enable the production of stem cell manufacture for therapeutic and clinical purposes. So just to give a very brief overview, there's been some introductions to stem cells, so I won't go into any details around that, but I'll just give a very brief overview of mesenchymal stem stromal cells. Now I use that term deliberately because not everyone considers MSCs to be stem cells in their true nature. They don't quite fit the definition as outlined in one of the earlier talks, uh, but they do have many of the, 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 the properties of what we'd consider to be classical stem cells, but not, as I said, quite fitting the definition. And therefore people often refer to them as cells. 
but ultimately they have been demonstrated to be useful for various uh, clinical outcomes and have demonstrated clinical utility. And one of the key advantages of uh, mesenchymal stem cells is that they're relatively easy to isolate. And we've been able to isolate uh, these MSCs from various areas in the body, including and primarily the bone marrow, but also from adipose tissue, from fat tissue, as well as uh, areas in the body such as the dental pulp. Uh, they've been demonstrated to show immunomodulatory properties, so they can start to control the response of, for example, T cells in response to infection and reducing inflammation. There's been lots of focus at the moment for their use in, uh, in ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome, particularly in response to COVID. But also they have been shown that they can differentiate into various cell types, particularly down the atipogenic, the chondrogenic and the osteogenic pathways. But also they've been shown to secrete various trophic factors as well. So they kind of act as mini pharmacies. So they can be delivered to the body, they can home to the site of injury and then release various uh, uh, trophic factors, cytokines or growth factors. But one of the things when we're looking at the manufacture and development of cell and gene-based therapies are the challenges that we face in terms of not just the clinical utility, but the ability to manufacture these cells. And so this was a speech given by Commissioner Gottlieb or recently resigned Commissioner Gottlieb of the US FDA, where back in 2018 at the Alliance for Regenerative Medicine meeting, he outlined a key challenge for the sector. According to his speech, he said that the greater challenge is effectively the limitation in manufacturing capability for cell and gene therapies. And he went further to highlight that we need to establish and consider developing scalable manufacturing processes that retain the inherent quality attributes of these advanced therapies. And so that's very much the core of the work that we do. It's how do we take what is often variable input because we're taking material from either patients or healthy donors, and we're trying to develop and, and, and generate and manufacture a consistent output. So how do we try and achieve that and achieve a product that can be delivered to patients? And when I first started working in this area about almost 15 years ago now, which often scares me, but the focus at the time was very much around how can we establish regulatory approval for these types of products? How can we get these products approved by the regulator? Well, now in 2022, we probably have well over 20 or 30 advanced therapy medicinal products approved either by the EMA or the US FDA. And so the focus for me now, and I think where the research is very much headed, is how do we ensure commercial viability of this industry? Uh, and that really comes down to improving the scalability and cost effectiveness of these therapies. And so to achieve that, I'm not going to go through this entire list, but within the research group that I lead, there is lots of focus around developing standardized and scalable, robust manufacturing processes, working with colleagues within the department to look at cost of goods models and business models for effective translation, and then looking at developing small scale models and trying to identify how we can minimize variability associated with the starting material. And that's what I'm gonna come on to in my talk today. So what does the current manufacture of MSCs or human mesenchymal stem cells look like? Well, this really is probably, I would say, state of the art. So this was a paper published in 1970 by Friedenstein et al, which was effectively the first isolation of MSCs, in this case taken from uh, guinea pig uh, bone marrow. And when you read that paper, you identify that they were using tea flasks to culture the cells and grow the cells. And 50 years later, we're still very much in that same modality or producing these cells in either static bags or static uh, tissue culture flasks. In this case, what we call cell factories. So these are static systems. They don't really allow for any agitation. It's very difficult to get samples and maintain homogeneity across the entire uh, system itself. But ultimately, these lack in scale. But this is really what I would say is state of the art. And you have these expensive clean rooms, which we have to ensure are kept sterile. And often the dirtiest things in those clean rooms are the human operators. And so the work that we've been trying to establish at UCL is how can we A, remove the need for using clean rooms and, and move to more scalable systems, but B, how can we move away from human operators and start to think about automated, perhaps robotically driven processes? And one of the ways we can start to think about this is by using alternative culture mechanisms. So at the moment, because uh, mesenchymal stem cells, as, as many of the stem cells you've heard about in, in the earlier presentations, are all anchorage dependent or adherent 
uh, cells. So they need a surface in order to grow. If the cells don't have a surface, they're not able to proliferate and they will end up ultimately uh, dying. So in this instance, what can we do to provide cells with a surface? So if we're moving from a flat culture surface, we can start to use microcarriers, which are uh, beads, uh, and they can be shaped in different shapes, sizes, charges, and different materials, which can be used to enable and support the attachment uh, and the growth and proliferation of stem cells or adherent cells. And the benefit of this is that we can then take these microcarriers, which are growing on uh, sorry, the, these microcarriers, which have cells growing on them, and then make use of the volumetric efficiencies of things like stirred tank bioreactors. Now, stirred tank bioreactors are particularly useful as a manufacturing platform because these are used widely throughout the biotech industry. When you look at any biotherapeutic manufacturer, be they recombinant proteins, or indeed more recently in the case of vaccine production. And so we can grow cells, both million and certainly bacterial cells, well over 20,000 liters, which is certainly not achievable uh, when we start to think about the, the flasks and the, uh, the cell factories that we looked at earlier. So the benefit of using microcarriers and allowing the cells to attach to these systems and then having them grow in these stirred tanks is not only do we get the scalability, but we also have the improved process monitoring and control. So the ability to be able to measure things like pH, dissolved oxygen, and, the, and other important culture parameters, glucose concentrations and so on, and control on this basis. And this just is, is, is a real life image of uh, cells growing on microcarriers. So you can see the cells attaching and proliferating on the microcarriers themselves. And this is kind of an example uh, of one of the bioreactors I actually use during my PhD. So this is a five liter stirred tank bioreactor. And this is actually, uh, I'll be showing data later in my presentation uh, from some of the studies we've undertaken uh, in this particular stirred tank system. But you can see here the number of probes and measuring and sensor devices that we can have within these platforms that allow us to tightly monitor and control these systems, which compared to tea flasks and cell factories, it, there's a vast difference in terms of the process, process control capability. But why is process control and consistency important? Here I'm gonna show some basic data that we've demonstrated and we've developed within our labs, showing the importance of moving towards more consistent processes. Mm -hmm. And firstly, why are consistent processes important? Well, ultimately it's about reducing the cost of goods. The, there is currently an approved therapy on the market using mesenchymal stem cells that's approved by Health Canada and the South Korean FDA, but it costs well in excess of $150,000 per dose, which is clearly unsustainable if we're looking to generate this product and deliver it to thousands of patients. So one of the key activities is trying to reduce the cost of goods. And by having uh, and focusing on consistent manufacture, we lower the risk of batch failure, which ultimately leads to increased productivity but also it supports comparability. And with many of these therapies, we're looking at multi-site manufacture, which require validating changes, which ultimately requires process and product understanding, as well as consistent manufacture. And one of the big areas of potential uh, variation is the fact that we often use serum in our processes, specifically fetal bovine serum. And this has innate lot-to-lot -lot variation. It's also limited in supply. It can contain immunogenic, 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 immunogenic components, uh, which can be detrimental to patient safety. And it doesn't allow for us to achieve tunability. So kind of really achieving that consistency in our overall cell culture medium. And this is reflected in the data. So we took six different bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cell lines, and we grew these in uh, monolayer culture. So in, in static T flasks, and you can start to see after eight passages effectively, uh, the difference between the cumulative population doublings between each of these six donors was very significant. And this is reflected in their metabolic profile as well. But also functionally, we can see from a functional perspective when we're looking here at the CFUF assay or the colony forming unit fibroblast efficiency assay, we can see significant differences in terms of the CFUF efficiency between the three different donors using a serum based process in our T flasks. So the research question we wanted to identify in this particular study was could we reduce the variability in process input material and develop a more consistent process? When individuals look at this data, and we've worked with many clinical colleagues, they often say, well, this is what we would expect. You know, this is different donor material. You know, we expect there to be some patient to patient or donor to donor variation. And our argument and the data I'll show in the next few slides 
I would say undermines that to some extent. I'm not denying that there will be donor to donor variation, but I often think that it's the variation we introduce into the process as a result of the undefined reagents or the lack of process control or automation that often leads to additional variation or exacerbates the donor to donor variation. So we wanted to undertake a study taking our two most divergent cell lines. Uh, so the ones that were a cell line that was performing the best, and I say cell line, these are primary cells, primary cells that were performing the best and primary cells that were performing the worst in terms of cell growth kinetics and, and CFEF efficiency, so a functional characteristic as well. And looking at growing them in fetal bovine serum, in human platelet lysate, and then chemically and serum free, chemically defined and serum free medium. And the idea was to grow these over multiple passages and just seeing what the outcomes of these uh, processes would be. And the outcomes were stark. So just to kind of draw your attention to the key aspects of these graphs, in green, we have the serum-free medium. In the red, we have the human platelet lysate. And in the blue, we have the, um, the FBS medium. And the, the area or the, the, the difference between the two uh, uh, cell lines is highlighted in the in the in the colors here and you can start to see the variation in our serum free medium is actually minimal or much lower compared to our serum based our fbs based and our hpl based certainly post passage six at passage six we have effectively i would say equivalent uh, uh, variation in terms of the uh, the f the sorry the serum free and the hpl but throughout from the outset we have quite large variation with our fetal bovine serum based conditions. But more importantly, not only were we able to achieve higher levels of consistency between our two most divergent cell lines, but also with our serum free medium, we're able to achieve the highest level of population doublings after passage nine. But this is also reflected in the uh, functional characteristics as well. So as you can see here, our, our two divergent cell lines with uh, grown in the serum free medium, you can see that the colony forming unit efficiency uh, for uh, the serum free are relatively tight and likewise with the osteogenic differentiation potential, whereas they're relatively large for the HPL and much larger for the FBS based conditions. So the cell characteristics are maintained in the serum free conditions, despite actually achieving much higher population doublings also. So we get the, the double effect of getting more cells, but also more functionally relevant cells as well. So then we wanted to move this now into thinking about how could we expand and manufacture at the liter scale. And so part of my PhD work was actually looking at uh, and, and presenting and demonstrating the first ever liter scale production of mesenchymal stem cells in a stirred tank bioreactor. So this was in a, this was in a, a five liter stirred tank and that actual same stirred tank I showed at the beginning of the presentation. And within this process, uh, and this is now data that dates back, I would say almost nine to 10 years, uh, but I like to show this because this was the first ever study we had undertaken, or that had been undertaken at this scale. Um, and by day nine, we were able to achieve about 170,000 cells per milliliter. So well over 400 million cells uh, in this particular production run, which from our perspective is certainly more than to produce uh, at least 20 doses uh, depending on the clinical application that we're looking to develop. And this is only at the five liter scale with the scope to try and extend this to certainly well beyond 50 to 100 liters, maybe even more. But it's not just about the cell quality, it's also about the cell, uh, sorry, the cell quantity, it's also about the cell quality. And in this case, we were starting to look at uh, using flow cytometry and using the ISCT criteria for determining uh, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, being able to show that they retained uh, the, um, the phenotypic markers, both pre-inoculation and post-harvest from the bioreactor, being able to plate these down into tissue culture plastic and showing that they could still attach to tissue culture plastic and being able to show that they could differentiate down the three different lineages. And so here you can see pre-inoculation, we had the cells which were expressing for the positive markers well above 99%, which is what we would expect. And then certainly post bioreact harvest again, uh, above 99%, um, really anything above 95% is acceptable. And then also what we're looking at here is to ensure that we don't have more than 5% of the negative markers being expressed. And that's certainly the case, both pre-inoculation and post harvest. So we're able to generate large numbers of cells as well as maintaining their quality. Now this state, as I said, was about 10 years ago, and we're now probably 10 times that level of yield. So back, back when we started this, we were at about 1.6 times 10 to the five cells per mil. We're now generating well over a million cells per milliliter. So it shows not only can we increase in scale, but if we can increase or 
establish process intensification methods, we can generate more cells within the same volume as well. And you can start to see here how we optimize or started to identify how we optimize our process. So this is from that same production run that I showed earlier, and this is the metabolite data. So that despite doing regular medium exchanges, so this is where you see these increases in glucose, for example, is where we do medium exchange. Despite doing regular medium exchanges, the cells were consuming glucose at such a rate that even despite doing a medium exchange two days before, the cells were consuming all the glucose and were running out of glucose. So you can start to see by being able to control and adapt our medium feeding strategy, we can start to increase and uh, produce even more cells. And that's what, how we've achieved higher efficiencies moving forward. Now kind of linking back in. So that previous work I showed was with serum-based medium. We now wanted to move and take on some of the early work we had done looking at serum free medium. And this is where we started to demonstrate once again in these stair tank bioreactors that we could now generate more cells with our serum free process. And uh, this shows, this is reflected in both the cell concentration as well as the population doublings, but also in terms of the uh, metabolite concentrations as well. The fact that the cells were able to maintain uh, their level of glucose consumption was fantastic. And we we're able to demonstrate that these cells could uh, effectively metabolize the glucose, especially when we were able to feed on demand or when the cells required it. And so compared to our serum containing process, where in this particular run, we were looking at about 80,000 cells per mil, in our serum free process, we were moving, and this is again, data that's about eight years old when we started to optimize, um, we were able to move to about 300,000 cells per milliliter, so generating about a 350% increase in overall yield. And importantly, it's not just about being able to grow the cells in the microcarriers, it's about how do we isolate and get single cells back off the microcarriers at the end. Now, I won't go into this, we've got a whole paper published at the bottom here where we describe our harvesting process, but we were able to uh, isolate the cells. You can see the, the small circles here are the cells and the large circles are the microcarriers. We we're able to uh, remove the cells from the surface of the microcarriers and then filter out the microcarriers and then just um, and, and have a single cell uh, suspension remaining at the end of the process, whilst also maintaining all of the quality features we would expect, the ability to differentiate, and you can see the cell growth on the microcarrier has been quite extensive in the serum-free conditions compared to the FBS conditions. But at the time, and, and this is still the case to some extent, the expansion process is clearly far from optimal. One of the challenges we start to find is that as our cells start to grow across all of the microcarriers and they form these cobweb-like structures, is that they start to uh, impede the growth of other cells. And so therefore there is a requirement to provide additional surface area. But this is easily resolved to some extent, and we published on this, the idea of B2B transfer. So we can have cells which by providing additional surface area, so providing new microcarriers or fresh microcarriers, during the course of the process, we can provide uh, the microcarriers and the cells will start to detach and attach to those fresh microcarriers. And so again, it's finding that optimal time to add the fresh microcarriers to allow uh, optimal expansion. So now thinking about integrating automation, and in this case, we started looking at uh, using automated small scale tools for bioprocess development. So again, why develop or look at automated small scale models? Well, the idea really is we wanna minimize resources. We don't want to do everything at five liters or above. Uh, the, the medium is very expensive. The growth factors we use can run into the hundreds of pounds per milligram. And so therefore we want to minimize resources, but ultimately we also want to increase throughput, improve efficiency, which will ultimately lead to a decrease in the time of market. And our current small scale model was using a kind of manual small scale stirred tank. So this is where a human operator such as myself would go into a biosafety cabinet and would have to um, do all the manipulations and then transfer this back into an incubator at the end and it would be magnetically driven uh, through a, an impeller. But there was a system on the market and there is a system on the market that has been very effective for uh, Cho clonal selection. So for Chinese hamster ovary uh, manufacture for uh, recombinant protein production, where it's been used effectively for clonal, clonal selection uh, and was designed to support high throughput uh, process development and capability. But it had never been used for adherent cells. So as I mentioned earlier, um, 
mesenchymal stem cells are adherent, and this system was designed primarily for CHO suspension cells. But this gives a very brief overview of the system itself. It has an automated liquid handler, uh, we, and you can prepare various scripts. You can have individual bioreactors, and this is uh, an example of one of the bioreactors, the size of a Tic Tac box, about 15 milliliters in volume. And you can have, in this instance, we have 24 bioreactors running in parallel, but you can have the same system running up to 48 bioreactors in parallel. And so part of my uh, fellowship that I had after my PhD was to look at how could we adapt this system to support adherent uh, stem cell uh, process development. And so in terms of some of the initial work that I'd done in comparing the spinner flask, the manual process versus the automated AMBER system, um, which stands for automated microbioreactor, the results weren't great. Uh, and so this was kind of at the end of my first year of a two year fellowship. And I thought, do I have to give the money back at this point? Uh, because the results weren't looking very good at all. Uh, where we had our spinner flask performing significantly better than our uh, AMBER system. But what we found was that when we were starting to investigate the causes for this is that in our AMBER system, we had the microcarriers which were clumping at the bottom of the cell, uh, at the bottom of the system itself. And so we, we had to find a way to be able to extract the cells for harvesting. And so the first question was, how do we successfully extract the microcarrier clump? We were able to achieve that and we effectively had to uh, find ways to stop the microcarriers from clumping. And when we did achieve that, stop the microcarriers from clumping, what we found was that although they weren't clumping at the bottom of the impeller, they were now clumping in the corners. However, we were starting to show improvement and uh, some level of, uh, I would say, uh, alignment and comparability with our spinner flask culture. But we still found that they were settling in the corners of the vessel. So using some chemical based techniques and to avoid the cells sticking or, or the microcarrier sticking to the sides of the, of the bioreactor, we were looking at how we could avoid the cells from doing so. And so the question was, how do we avoid clumping altogether? Again, I won't go into the details as that's published in the paper uh, on this issue, but you can see here from this video where we've got the, um, we've got the cells being grown in the system. And this is where we have significant clumping. You can see that we've got large clumps being formed in the corners here. Uh, which was which was particularly concerning, and and these large focules of of microcarriers, which is not ideal. However, by using a combination of methods, and as I said, part part of it was chemically based, uh, and others were looking at a, a, adapting the steering or, or agitation mechanism, we were able to show effective comparability, and so we could demonstrate that the amber was a effective small scale model. And I think the proof is in the pudding or in the video, as they say. And so here's a um, here's a video of that improved process where we still get some clumping in the corners, but you get far more uh, of a number of microcarriers, which are now single microcarriers with cells attached to them. And it's, in, uh, and it's growing in far better conditions. So to allow the cells for effective growth and proliferation in these bioreactors. So the question is, once, once we've demonstrated that the amber could be used uh, as a small scale platform, could it be used for process development? And one of the areas we always wanted to improve the process was the fact that in the first 24 hours, we would have a significant loss of growth. So the cells would effectively, once we added the microcarriers in the cells, there would actually, many of the cells would die uh, within the first 24 hours and it would take a while to recover. So the question we had was, could we avoid this particular uh, post-inoculation poor uh, growth phase? And the answer again was yes. And again, I won't go into the details because that's in the paper, but the data clearly shows that with our improved process, and we had two or three improvements that we made to our process, not only did we not get this reduction in cell growth, we actually got a slight increase in that first 24 hours. And ultimately that led to a far higher cell density in the same period of time, resulting in a, an overall increase uh, of about 70%. And also importantly, a 20 hour reduction in the doubling time. Now we've done that with the amber. How does the amber now compare to the larger scale 100 milliliter spinner flask? Uh, and could this improved process, so now that we've taken this improved process and we've done it at the small scale, if we take the same conditions we've established in that small scale process and apply that to the spinner flask, would we get similar outcomes? The answer was very much yes. We did have a level of comparability, uh, which was great to see. Uh, and ultimately, we showed equivalent growth kinetic data between both the spinner flask and the amber system. And we've now taken this up to the liter scale. And so it provides a high throughput process model. But this is where I think the other important data comes in. It's 
one of the other key things we're able to show is the level of consistency between the automated bioreactor one. So the, all these individual uh, points uh, on, the, on the plot here are individual runs. You can start to see uh, individual runs with the automated system being far more uh, consistent compared to the manual process. And I would like to blame the operator here, but the operator was me. Um, and, uh, and I'd had a number of years of experience by this point, but I could never compete with the automated process in terms of the consistency we'd, we could achieve between runs. And I should say in each case, we're using the same medium, we're using the same donor cells, and the process is being run at the same time. And now kind of bringing everything together, what we're able to show is with the amber, uh, with the spinner flask uh, and the serum free, we we're able to show much higher cell densities that we could achieve. And this is now where I allude to the fact that we're getting, in this case, about 800,000 cells per mil, but we've got data now over a million cells per mil. We were able to achieve uh, a very high cell density that we need to start thinking about for clinical manufacture. But also you can start to see the, the importance of, of serum free. Um, so the serum free leads us to leads us to a 250% increase in yield, and that's reflected in the various growth uh, kinetic data, the growth rate, the population doubling, and the doubling time. And then finally, on this part of the data, just the, the comparison between automated and manual. Um, so here, what we we're able to show is that in our best conditions, serum free with our automated system, we had the we had the most consistency between all of the different runs. So the final point, and I'll, and I'll show this very quickly uh, in terms of just a, a very brief video. We were then awarded a 6 million euro project focused on automated stem cell manufacture. So the idea was to create an automated manufacturing facility for human mesenchymal stem cell production, where the idea would be we'd, we'd have an automated system to collect the material from the donor. And then everything within the blue arrow here would be completely automated right the way through to getting a frozen cryovial at the end, at which point it would be outputted to the uh, human operator. And so this was the platform concept uh, or, or the design that we had in mind. We had two different robots. I won't go into the details. It was for, um, we had one area which was grade D and one area which was grade A uh, for stem cell production, um, where we had any auto uh, open and manipulations that was where we needed a grade A area. But we effectively had a process which would allow for two robotic systems to manufacture multiple donor material uh, for stem cell production. So here's some of the data. Um, we're about to publish this in one of the large journals showing the comparability between the, the manual operated stair tank bioreactor versus the automated robotic run automated stair tank bioreactor system as well. And very quickly, I'll show a video here of the bioreactor system in operation. Uh, also, the, the automated platform in operation. So this is the end of the process where we're now we've completed the production in the bioreactor. We've isolated and harvested the cells um, and the robot is now undergoing or completing the cryoval uh, addition. So it's now taking the material uh, from the bioreactor, the single cell suspension, and it's now adding the freezing medium and then transferring the, the cryovials uh, and filling the cryoval. So, Nothing particularly exciting. Obviously, many of you will be familiar with the robotic platform. But one of the things I do want to show here is the fact that whilst this is ongoing and, and effectively harvested and completing the operation for a particular patient, we're able to manufacture another patient at the same time. And so we can start to think about generating that throughput at larger scales. So just to wrap up, um, in terms of the kind of the future prospects and kind of where we're headed. So from my perspective, we have to look at advances in automated technology to support process understanding and scale up. We have to be able to control raw materials. And that's shown, I think, particularly with some of the serum free and chemically defined work that we've done. Developing suitable and automated small scale models is going to be key to reducing uh, variation and improving optimize and improving process development and optimization efforts. And then finally, having clearly defined endpoints, both in vitro and in vivo. This is kind of where we're heading moving forward. And we've also just been awarded a 10 million euro project to apply this platform for now CAR T cell or gene modified T cell production and, integrated a, and integrating a point of care manufacturing system at a hospital in Germany. And with that, I'd like to thank colleagues with the UCL, our colleagues at Fraunhofer IPT uh, and in the UK and our uh, industrial partners and our funding bodies. And thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take any questions if there's time. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. That was pretty mind blowing looking at the numbers and the, and the scale up. Um, I'd encourage people to use the Q&A and, and chat to post further questions. I mean, I, I had 
a, a ton, but I'll, maybe I'll just pick out one or two. The for the um, for the micro carriers, I, I guess there are. You sort of touched on this. There, are, I guess there are a lot of parameters that influence the cell adhesion and the properties of the cells, the dimensions, and the surface chemistry. I mean, I, I don't know where you start with working out what the appropriate properties are for for culturing stem cells. Could you? Kind of comment on that yeah absolutely. it's a great question and, and and that was kind of the pandora's box that we opened about 10 to 12 years ago us and, and other groups colleagues in singapore and in portugal um and what we found is that the surface chemistry does play an important role as well as the size and density of, of the microcarrier particle um we've undertaken and again we've published on this a, a microcarrier screening study um where we looked at I think 15 different commercially available microcarriers, as well as some in-house developed microcarriers. And we found that there were some commonalities, particularly for mesenchymal stem cells, where certainly having a, um, a neutral charge was important. Um, so some felt that if we had a positive charge, the cells might grow better, but actually we found that a neutral charge was, was important. Um, microcarriers that weren't particularly dense was also important. There, were, there was also a comparison of macroporous and microporous microcarriers. So microcarriers that would allow for the cells to grow inside the actual microcarrier itself. But actually we found that that can be detrimental to support mass transfer. So there's a, there's a range of different parameters, both in terms of the, the microcarriers themselves, but also once you get the microcarriers in the culture, how you then optimize that process as well. Thanks. And then maybe the other one I'll, I'll ask, just in the interest of time, I was interested in the QC monitoring in the bioreactor. So I think quite a few of the, the, if I understand correctly, the data you showed, I guess you would need to sample some of that and then you would uh, you'd do some immuno labeling or, or other, other types of metabolomics. So what, what's kind of the state of the art in terms of actually monitoring the properties of the, of the culture in situ within the bioreactor? Great question again, and, and these are conversations we're having actively now, not just for stem cells, but for any cell type. Um, so, and, and this is where we're really trying to push uh, our you know, industrial colleagues or certainly clinical colleagues to move towards kind of more developed technologies, because that's often the major limitation, even in the more advanced platforms. So for example, we often tend to measure pH, dissolved oxygen and temperature online, and we can control for those. We can, in some cases, measure uh, cell density and viability uh, online using uh, biocapacitance. Uh, and we're now starting to, we're starting to see probes coming on the market that can support the measurement of certain metabolites, so glucose and lactate. But that's really the state of the art. Um, we ourselves are developing with colleagues um, a Raman spectro, spectrophotometer to look at the measurement of more metabolites. But again, this is where it would be great to you know, reach out to colleagues who are who have a strong physics background and a te te technology driven background to support in that effort, because there's a huge demand for that. I mean, the analytics and the QC is the biggest challenge across the cell engine therapy industry, without a doubt. And so getting the input and support of you know, those on the call, but also colleagues and collaborators globally would be fantastic. Thanks. And I, I just see this one question that's popped popped into the, um, the Q&A function which I'll ask. So the question was, can the microcarriers be made of materials with differing stiffnesses or given different hydrogel coatings? Absolutely. Um, that's a great question again, because that's something we have looked at, but also, and I would say others have looked at that in more detail, um, looking at different hydrogel coatings, looking at different uh, porosities, looking at different uh, stiffnesses. Um, that's been a core focus of, of the work. And it's becoming even more important now. I mean, obviously the work I shared was for adherent stem cell production, but for suspension T cell manufacture and for viral vector production, which has now become a major activity within the whole ATMP space, I would say more so than stem cells, that's even more important, particularly viral vector production, because we're looking at how can we coat uh, micro, sorry, how can we coat viral vector uh, or T cells, for example, so that when we transfer them to the patient in terms of an, an in vivo gene therapy, how can they avoid the neutralizing antibodies within the patient's body and get to the site of delivery or interest that we want to deliver them to? So absolutely, the, the whole biomaterials aspect is, is critical. And so when I talk about optimization, it is very much in multiple areas. It's the biomaterials, it's the cell culture and scalability and manufacture, it's the QC and the analytics, and it's ultimately the delivery back to the patient as well. Wonderful. Okay, well, let's, in the interest of time, let's move on. So our second talk is by Dr. Vijay Pawar uh, from University College London. So 
Vijay is a senior research fellow in the computer science department, and he leads multidisciplinary engineering team developing micro robotic and large scale robotic methods for manipulation and manufacturing tasks. So um, over to you, Vijay. Hi there, Mike. Can you see my screen? It's really? good. It's good. Okay, brilliant. Um, well, firstly, thank you for the invitation to talk about our work. And uh, uh, as you mentioned, I'm Vijay Pawar from the Department of Computer Science at UCL. And today I'll be discussing our research from the Touch Lab, specifically lessons learned over the several uh, over the past several years, investigating um, different types of robotic solutions to help us manipulate objects in micro to nano environments. As a general theme, the aim of the talk is to highlight primarily at a high level, as I've only got, I've only got 10 minutes, the need for different types of control strategies, in particular using machine dynamics to achieve more sophisticated dexterous uh, uh, robot manipulation solutions comparable to how we can intuitively handle objects with our hands. Uh, I'll also touch upon current trends in sensing, control and micro actuation, showing what's possible now and projecting uh, potential solutions into the future. And I'll finish by touching uh, briefly on concepts to support swarm based micro manipulation systems and why this is exciting in terms of demonstrating uh, robotic workflows that try to mimic nature inspired self organizing manufacturing systems. So, to start, we began our research. Um, reflecting on traditional examples as seen in robot manufacturing, and then wondering how these approach to automation could be scaled down to, uh, to overcome manipulation challenges observed in micro nano environments. When studying this further, especially strategies used by nature, we quickly saw some striking differences. On the left, you have industrial robots typically fixed to perform very specific tasks with limited feedback, whilst on the right, um, you have individual cells seemingly reacting to each other in real time, demonstrating highly agile methods of manipulation and quickly creating solutions that overcome unexpected and, and local uncertainties. Given these observations, this led us to think about how we could replicate these behaviors in robots and what would be the potential benefits. For example, whilst current industrial robots today are highly automated, the variety of motions typically used are very conservative demonstrating only a fraction of what is mechanically possible. At its core, one could argue that this limitation is due to the underlying control technology being used and the model assumptions that aim to mainly simplify or constrain the mechanics of the system. In contrast, we believe robots in the future should use controllers that exploit the natural uh, dynamics of machines with the expectation this will lead to highly flexible and stable um, micro manufacturing systems. So to illustrate current challenges uh, at, at present, um, robots perform object manip uh, manipulation using a, a, a stereotypical pipeline. First, um, we identify a set of contact locations, um, try to localize the various objects in the environment, and then plan a co collision-free path to those identified locations with a suitable large event horizon. At this point, figuratively, we uh, press the execute button, close the horizon, hope for the best. Um, and uh, with, uh, with, with the hope that uh, you know, uh, the action is successful without causing too much mess. Um, and in most cases, when using open loop control, this approach works work, work quite well. For example, performing simple pick and place type tasks. However, when considering the wider variety of dexterous manipulations uh, possible with present day actuation and MEMS based end effectors, these open loop uh, approaches quickly fall down. So, uh, especially when handling soft deformable objects. In most cases, if the robot fails to make contact and at the anticipated time points and locations specified, bad things tend to happen. For example, probes overshoot, overshooting, damaging potentially a, a high value cell line or the system completely breaking. This is further complicated as micro nano environments also include various snapping and adhesion contact effects due to various band well, capillary uh, and the uh, electrostatic uh, forces present when two micro nano objects collide with each other. And in these cases, this can result in unwanted debris sticking to the end effectors, making subsequent manipulation tasks cumbersome to use. 
Therefore, without this additional information, it's very hard to consider more sophisticated manipulation strategies. For example, as we do when using our hands, we often intuitively exploit the mechanical behavior of the object, capturing, for example, the for example, flipping effects to then understand adaptive strategies to quickly pick up objects. And it's these types of features that we want to try and replicate in modern day robot manipulation systems. In terms of capabilities available today, since the uh, 1990s, new results in robot micro manipulation has led to several key advances in the, the design of new actuation, sensing, and good control approaches. To take a deeper look, I would recommend reading Zhang et al. 2019 paper, and it, it which provides an extensive review of different approaches. And here we can see a progression from high level DOS uh, fixed micro manipulation platforms and member space for sensing and effective to more recently mobile robot systems showcasing multi-robot and even multi-agent approaches to micro-manipulation. Micro and since 2005, a large number of mobile robot, uh, mobile uh, micro-robots have been developed and, uh, uh, and deployed. For example, uh, show, uh, uh, multiple robots being magnetically, optical, uh, optically or acoustically actuated to perform different types of dexterous tasks, even folding type tasks to buy a hybrid uh, micro -thimid. And within this context, these new techniques, rather than using feedback control to override the dynamics uh, of these machines, they have looked to exploit new material activation approaches. These examples are interesting as they show uh, what, what, what we can achieve in terms of greater efficiency, agility, and robustness from uh, new forms of robots that, 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 are, uh, that are designed um, to take advantage of the, of the uh, dynamics uh, of the environment and not cancel them out. Surprisingly, many formal control ideas do not support the idea of, of exploiting the dynamics, and especially when designing controllers for nonlinear systems, models that fully represent the contact mechanics of micro uh, nano environments remain uh, under uh, explored. So now stepping back to, uh, to, to, to try to work out generalizable robot control strategies, um, we can start by considering the classical sense, plan, and act model. For example, on the right, we have a robot. It, it, it perceives it, its environment from some sort of sensing. It revises its internal state, selects a, uh, a possible action from a plan uh, action library, and then acts. For these models to work, it's important that, these, uh, that there is a continuous feedback on how the environment is changing, especially when manipulating in dynamic environments. Now, given the, the typical scale ratios in micro nano environments for, uh, of manipulating robots versus the objects being manipulated, and then taking that forward in terms of scaling this across multiple robots, this routine can become very computationally expensive. So as a result, uh, researchers started to wonder, are there other ways uh, of doing things and seeing if, if this type of control structure can be described in, in a different way, for example, on the right, uh, as a series of layers um, so this type of work uh, has been kind of pushed forward, has started by people like Rodney Brooks, who could kind of took these ideas further by considering actions as a series of behaviors that can um, interact with each other in some form of hierarchy. So in this model, you have a series of actions that don't necessarily feed into each other, that could all happen concurrently. For example, uh, manipulating micro robot could be communicating, but also at the same time, detecting a new position to avoid obstacles. Now, the interesting aspect of this approach is that you can decide the priority of different actions or even provide weights to achieve a range of motor responses quickly, rather than searching through a large action library. And by doing so, we're letting the layers uh, decide what is an appropriate action, providing very quick, flexible and computationally efficient ways of deciding what is best and, access and accessing a wider variety of manipulation approaches. To date, these ideas have been extensively explored uh, in the small robotics community, and advances have been demonstrated in various simulation and toy-based uh, mobile mobile platforms, with the grand goal of showcasing mobile robots with features for self-organization. Whilst this is primarily a new area of work, especially uh, in terms of the, the controlling of micro-robots, the, 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 the potential 
possibilities are very exciting. For example, we can, by applying these uh, these types of models, we expect to see highly agile uh, robot micro systems. For example, constructing a system that can adjust to new stimuli on the fly based upon uh, in situ various uh, variations in, in situ parameters. Having a, a robot system that can constantly shift its focus of adaption over time from one part of the system to another. Inherently being quite resilient, so collective systems are built upon the idea of multiple agents working in parallel, therefore exploiting redundancy and the system being capable of handling small losses and ultimately exploiting features where there's no limit on size and scale of manufacture. So if we're able to sort of start to explore and devise new, new control strategies that can better explore swarm-based principles, we think that this, could, that this could offer new potentials for manipulating objects in micro nano environments. So in terms of sort of final remarks to sort of finish off with, um, at a high level, we've kind of discussed the need for new control strategies, specifically with the focus on uh, modeling the dynamics of the robot and the environment. And, uh, and, uh, and showing that right now, due to with recent advances in actuation and sensing, there are lots of opportunities for uh, developing uh, platforms that utilize multi mobile uh, um, mobile multi robot uh, 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 robots that, that can behave uh, like like a, like a collective, and with with the, with the view that this can then start to explore what are the possibilities of using form based manipulation approaches within this context. Um, of course, there are many challenges uh, uh, to come, and hopefully this provides a good link um, to the next speaker, which is hopefully uh, showing the, the possibilities around the corner of using micro robot robots in different contexts. Thank you very much. Thanks, BJ. Really nice mm -hmm. overview. Um, I guess I just one quick question for me, um, which I know you partly addressed, but I know that you work across these really big differences in length scale so you're sort of operating mm. the, the building level and mm. the micro nano mm. i mean to what extent is it the the, are the approach is common can be ported and to what extent are the, are the domains mm. so different and the challenges different that you need that essentially you can't mm. learn from one and apply it to the other i mean um when when looking at these extreme scales um you you start to have to address challenges where um you know vision-based approaches um, don't often work. So you have to really sort of look at um, mechanics, forces, and, and seeing how you can leverage these signals to overcome natural uncertainties that, 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 that occur when multiple robots try to work together uh, to, to try and build structures in a, in a consistent and, a, and, and repeatable way. Um, and this is kind of why, you know, by, by looking at these um, sort of extreme men scale, we can start looking at for the fundamental kind of, kind of control concepts. I think that that's part, primarily what uh, the, the, the sort of glue that kind of pulls these sort of aspects together, um, where we can show that, you know, these are kind of platform technologies that enable, you know, whether it's a, a mobile robot that, that's, that's operating, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the macro scale or a very, very small micro robot, all the planning and sort of task sequencing that enables that sort of swarm-like behavior to occur uh, is, is quite similar. And, you know, they're, 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 they're capable of, of adapting to these, you know, sort of unusual physical um, mechanics that, 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 that sort of build up as you kind of build uh, uh, in these modes. Great, thanks very much. So in an attempt to keep to time, let's move on. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Laurent Manillo, who's a research fellow at UCL. Uh, his research focuses on investigating AI-driven methods for autonomous perception, navigation, and cooperation of optoelectronic microrobots in dynamic environments. So this nicely leads on from one of the talks we heard in the first session. Um, and today, Laurent's going to be talking about adaptive autonomous navigation of multiple optoelectronic microrobots in dynamic environments. So Laurent, can you share your screen? Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Is it full screen? Perfect. 
Yep. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the introduction. Um, so, yeah, I'm Laurent Mignot. I'm a research fellow at UCL uh, since uh, 2020. And uh, today I'm um, actually uh, going to talk about the adapt. Oh, sorry. Mm. But it's not like automatically going to the next slide. Uh, so the uh, adaptive auton autonomous navigation of multiple optoelectric microrobots in dynamic environments. So it's uh, based on the seminal work by uh, Zhang that um, so Long Zhang that presented earlier uh, in the in the session um, using uh, the optic electronic microrobot that he um, presented earlier, and uh, in the uh, objective of uh, tar target harvesting. Uh, so um, those microbots uh, are um, dielectric structures, so that are manipulated by light, and um, uh, they are used to exert forces on secondary objects. So um, the particular uh, quality that they have is that they are uh, really uh, gentle and they are particularly suited to um, biological cell manipulation. So um, on the right, you can see a little image of uh, dissociated tissue with the cell in red and the debris of the tissue in uh, green. And uh, as you can see, like this kind of environment is uh, pretty uh, dense and populated with unwanted uh, structures. So one of the main uh, objective of using um, uh, optoelectronic microbots or OEMs is really to um, 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 use uh, methods for visual detections or, sorry, for visual detection of those um, uh, targets, so the cells, and navigating um, while avoiding all the debris. <clears throat> so we have um, previously worked on a solution, an open solution uh, last year, um, that was published last year, uh, that uh, mainly um, uh, handle the task of harvesting, but in a uh, static environment. Uh, so because of the open loop nature of the system, there was no video feedback and uh, only um, full detection uh, in the initial initialization phase of the system. And the uh, uh, microbots were um, basically applying like a pre-recorded um, 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 path following and uh, harvesting task. And what the, what are the problem of this approach is that um, these microbots uh, were um, not easily um, harvesting the cells because the, the cells or uh, microbes were moving uh, uh, at the time of the um, uh, experiment. So uh, we needed uh, something that was uh, able to react to uh, this kind of motion. So um, the Next step was to uh, develop a new system that was adaptive and reacting in real time to the environment. So the main demonstration we uh, did uh, is uh, basically um, uh, to uh, use the microbot and in a simulated environment first. Uh, um, so you can see on the right the image uh, showing blue dots that are the microbot and uh, yellow dots that are the targets. And the, the goal of those microbots is to harvest the targets. Um, um, so in, in yellow, while avoiding uh, stacky, static obstacles, so the black boxes and moving obstacles, the gray boxes. And the ultimate goal is to uh, place them uh, in a release zone. So uh, represented here by the red dot. And uh, the system uh, has to comport some sort of uh, real-time video feedback that allows to, uh, for failure detection, possible recovery from these failures, and is composed of several modules. So uh, simul simultaneous localization mapping module, uh, detection module, uh, path planning module, and um, a full, um, <clears throat> um, a full, um, um, sorry. Um, a full uh, system simulation um, for um, um, object motion, so a kinematics module, and um, um, different steering behaviors to allow the microbot to perform a range of operations. So uh, the system looks like this. Um, so uh, we have 
uh, DMD, so it's a um, light projector that projects the light uh, of uh, light pattern to move the microbots inside uh, the light path of the microscope. Everything is recorded by a camera up top, and uh, the light is projected onto the device that allows the microbot to move with uh, the electrophoresis. And uh, so um, the current framework I'm going to talk about and what I mainly worked on is uh, the gray box, uh, so the concurrent framework that uh, takes all these images and uh, the stage position. Um, and um, from this information, um, tries to uh, project the light pattern at the right position to move the mi micro robot where we want them to go. So you can see uh, on the right, um, there is um, kind of a um, lot of constraint for the system in the sense that the stage uh, and uh, the device area is pretty large and the microscope and the camera is not able to see the full uh, extent of the, of the device. So uh, we had to um, um, find ways to um, basically uh, map the whole device while uh, observing just a tiny part of it. And uh, the projector also uh, projects in the camera field of view, uh, but in a nonlinear manner. So we had to uh, also calibrate the projector. So um, everything um, uh, in the system was calibrated in terms of hardware. So the, the camera uh, were calibrated, was calibrated to remove the optical distortion. The stage then uh, uh, was calibrated to uh, get the rigid transform, uh, allowing to uh, go from uh, the stage reference frame to the image reference frame. And uh, the projector was also then calibrated uh, to be able to precisely project uh, in the field of view of the camera, the light patterns to move the micro robots. So you can see um, on the bottom uh, of the image, two images uh, showing the simultaneous localization and mapping. So um, basically th this is a, a full device and uh, all the uh, squares you can see that are kind of overlapping are just uh, one field of view of camera. So we had to um, develop like through this calibration system, uh, a way to really map uh, precisely the wall device uh, and um, um, be able to navigate uh, the wall device um, with video feedback with the camera. And on the right, you can see a labeled, labeled map uh, of uh, this bright field view uh, that is exactly the same uh, device but uh, on the right you have like a kind of a higher level uh, view of uh, how the structures are uh, disposed on the device um, and those structures are actually the obstacles that this, the, the microbot will have to avoid um, uh, in the future so um, there is uh, one module that then handle the image processing and um, particularly the uh, detection of the microbots. So those microbots you can see uh, on the right um, are quite um, a specific shape. Uh, and um, so it's a cogwheel shape that uh, we used in our experiments. Uh, so in the image A, you can see like a, a bright field view of the microbot. This image is then pre-shouldered uh, to get the image B. And the background is removed uh, in the in the image C, uh, so the background, the white white background. So we are left with um, blobs, so connected components uh, in the of uh, in the in the images, and those connected connected components are then grouped into into clusters, uh, depending on the um, uh, distance, the Euclidean distance between all these connected com components. And in these clusters, we evaluate all the combination of community connected components and uh, see which one uh, are, uh, fit the, the size and area of the micro robot. When we have a valid cluster, a valid combination, uh, we use a template image, so it's the F uh, image uh, on the right, uh, a template image of a micro robot that is um, derived from the CAD model of the micro robot and try to match it uh, with a, invariant, a rotation invariant uh, descriptor uh, to the image B. And if the match is correct, we have a position of micro robot in the image. And to compute the orientation, we uh, compute the distance transform of the image C. Uh, so it's represented in the image D. 
And from these systems transform, we uh, apply a circular, a predefined circular, circular regime uh, to get the highest value uh, of uh, this distance transform um, um, when um, performing the union of the two. Uh, and this highest value of the distance transform actually corresponds to the aperture of the micro robot. So we then have uh, an orientation for the micro robot. After detecting the micro robot in the image, we perform uh, path planning uh, and um, um, object motion and uh, the motion and compute the motion of the of the, the field of view of the camera. So the motion of the stage. So we used a decentralized path planning uh, path planner. So it's Pierre and Star. Uh, that is working on the uh, labeled map, so the the, um, the map you can see on the bottom right of the video, so the map of labels uh, and free space. Uh, so the free space is the space where the micro robot can navigate. Uh, and uh, from this um, path uh, computed for each micro robot to their target, we then uh, employ uh, steering behaviors that are computed in real time uh, using Euler integration. Uh, and uh, those steering behavior uh, basically allow uh, the objects to move. Uh, so um, you can see on the simulation that uh, the robots are uh, using like a path following uh, kind of uh, behavior to follow the, their trajectories, the computer trajectories by the path planner. And they also can avoid obstacles. So we have kind of um, two components there. Uh, for, for navigation, we have uh, first um, path planning method that is uh, actually uh, updated in real time to accommodate for the uh, debris uh, or moving obstacles. But we al also have an obstacle avoidance system that allows uh, the micro robot to deviate from their path if uh, the path planner has not completed the update. So it's basically uh, seeing the system as having like a GPS. Uh, to compute uh, the, 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 the route uh, to a destination in the car and having the driver that actually uh, managed to avoid the other cars uh, um, during, during uh, uh, driving. And then we have um, a stage motion planner that actually uh, moves uh, the, the camera field of view to uh, maximize the navigable path length. Uh, so, uh, on the image on the left, we have uh, so uh, multiple micro robots, two micro robots with uh, their associated trajectories. And uh, you can see that we have an, uh, another one, a third one. And uh, this, this third one is not in the field of view of the camera, so it actually cannot be moved. So we developed this kind of uh, strategy to um, maximize the navigable path uh, the, the micro robot can, uh, can navigate. And uh, like the, it's working on a discretized grid, and like the, the best position for the for the for the the, the highest navigable path are selected uh, by the system uh, as the new uh, camera position. So here you have an overview of the framework, uh, so the, the the software framework, and uh, one of the um, main thing that is uh, actually echoing what uh, VJ was uh, telling you about earlier is that it's asynchronous. And so all operation uh, occur at the same time in parallel. But uh, the asynchronous uh, part of the system is um, allowing the system to have like different cycle speeds for all these modules. So the frame graver uh, can run at a certain frequency and the mapper at another one. And uh, every module can run at their own frequency, at their own frequency. And uh, what's really uh, interesting in our case is that uh, the um, motion um, of the, the kinematics module or the, um, the motion of the, the micro robot can run at a very high frequency that allows to have like a really smooth motion for the micro robots when they are moving. So here you can see a um, simulated experiment uh, on a really large device with 10 micro robots and 100 virtual obstacles. And so the micro robots are um, going uh, to their target position, assigned target position. And their objective is to um, basically um, put, um, like harvest these targets and drop them off in the target, in the, in the well you can see in the middle. And once they have finished uh, dropping their targets, they are uh, going parking. 
So you can see uh, the micro but successfully avoiding each other and um, um, navigating this uh, complex environment, uh, dynamic environment. And if I uh, show you uh, our results on the real system, That's uh, exactly sorry. so. That exactly the same uh, experiment, but uh, there uh, you can see real micro, but on the real device, uh, actually moving uh, together to. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually moving to uh, get to their target, and then um, again uh, uh, going to that drop-off area and parking area. Uh, and all, all of this happening in real time, we have uh, simulated uh, moving obstacles and uh, virtual targets for these experiments. Uh, so uh, the next steps in designing this kind of system is uh, to actually uh, use physical targets, so microsphere or micro uh, and afterwards uh, real cells uh, to be able to demonstrate like the ability of this micro but to really uh, perform the harvesting task and uh, hopefully deliver like really pure uh, cell population in uh, really um, challenging conditions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laurent. I think the video is fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a, just a question about, I guess, about the scale. So, I mean, I, I know that this is in the simulation and in the real data here, you've shown a small number of micro robots, but what do you think the, the limits are to scaling this up? So the, the, the main uh, component to consider is the uh, magnification of the, so the, the size of the field of view of the camera um, when uh, working on large devices. Uh, so um, basically the magnification allows the micro, but uh, like to see multiple micro, but at the same time, if we have a low, low magnification, we can hopefully work on smaller targets uh, but if we have, uh, if it's low, then uh, like the um, number of micro, but we can uh, operate at the same time is limited. Um, so uh, that, that's a point to consider with uh, lower magnification, we can work on more micro, but then uh, it may be difficult to see, um, to see all the targets uh, if we are working with uh, really uh, small targets. And um, so basically, there, there is this point to consider. And uh, the other point is, um, since uh, we are not working on the full device at the same time, uh, like uh, we can also uh, really characterize um, a sort of um, um, higher um, um, threshold in terms of uh, the number of mi micro robots we can manipulate. So basically, the, the, the device can be really large, um, but um, the, the number of micro robots we can manipulate at the same time um, um, will be limited by the field of view of the camera. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm not doing quite as good timekeeping job as Cindy, so maybe we should move on, but thanks again, Laurent. Yeah. So for our final talk of the day, we're going to pop back across the Atlantic. Um, and this talk is the University of Toronto. And he's going to be talking today about micro machines driven by optoelectronic tweezers. Thank you, Mike. Looks good. Off you go, Mohammed. Okay. Um, so it has Shalong and Laura already talked a lot about optoelectronic tweezers. Um, so I'm not going to spend too much time of an intro, but in essence, the simplest, it's, it's actually quite simple. The simplest uh, device would be this uh, two plate device uh, that we can hold together with uh, spacers or, or uh, double sided tape. Uh, and then we put this in on a microscope stage and uh, we're using this uh, integrated projector uh, to project light patterns. And uh, that's where we can put the like robots or, or these closed gear shapes. And, uh, oh yeah, I didn't mention that the wires go to uh, an AC signal, an amplifier, but I don't think that's... Uh... And uh, we can form, we can use 
differently shaped tape to form channels. And then you can have tubings uh, for inlet and outlet. Um, so uh, the talk is about micro machines. I'm gonna start with just, we have one gear and we rotate it. We form these vortices. And uh, this is actually not sped up. This is actually the, the real time. Uh, and uh, we can uh, measure the velocity of these beads and uh, figure out what the flow velocity is at different locations due to these vortices. Uh, so as expected, the closer you are to the, uh, the closer the bead is to the rotating micro motor, uh, the higher the velocity. And the faster you're rotating the gear, again, the higher the velocity of the bead. And then we can actually move into micro machines. We can combine two micro motors to create this uh, touchless micro feed roller. Um, and it's touchless. So the, the bead is moving without touching anything. And we can do this with, uh, with cells as well. This was a cancer cell, I forget which, uh, which line. Uh, I think it was a breast cancer cell. Um, and uh, we can move it actually faster using this method than direct OET, Doppler electronic tweezers. And uh, this was an interesting uh, uh, part where we can get the beads to also jump. So now we're not only moving in 2D, we're moving in 3D. So one thing uh, we didn't mention before is that when we shine the light and turn on the electric field, there are several force components. There's the X, Y, and then there's also a Z that we typically try to avoid uh, because it complicates things, but we can actually try to make use of and make a bead jump into a well We haven't been able to uh, do this yet for cells because uh, typically the medium, when we're working with cells, we add uh, sucrose uh, and, and other stuff to make it more cell friendly. And uh, that tends to make, uh, make it the maximum speed we can rotate the gears is a little bit lower. So we weren't able to get this jumping yet with, with cells, but it would be really cool if we could. Uh, moving on, we can combine them to make gear trains. So that's one gear moving to rotate a second gear. The second one on the right has no light patterns moving it. And then we can move one gear, an active gear, rotating three passive gears. And as expected, as the number of gears increase, uh, we're, we're losing some uh, velocity. It's not a very efficient, I guess, gear train, but it's still uh, doable. And one way to overcome that is to combine the motion of several gears. So here we see two active gears moving one passive gear or four active gears driving three passive gears. And we can uh, move this further into uh, we're rotating a small gear uh, to drive a large gear. So this is a torque multiplier. And we can do this again, gear train with uh, torque multiplying. And then the opposite where we're driving a large gear to uh, drive a small gear. So this one is really obvious. You can see that you were moving at a certain speed and then the, the speed of the second small one is uh, much larger. And then we asked uh, an interesting question. Okay, so this is all this uh, rotating motion. Can we transform rotary motion to linear motion? And the answer is yes. Um, so here we have a rack and pinion uh, structure where we can move a gear and that would move the rack and we can do this to generate uh, this microfluidic valve you can 
choke the flow. You can um, block the flow on certain channels and, and get the flow in, in others. Uh, these are just close ups of the same. Yeah, so here I'm showing we can open one of the three. And then this is, we have this one open where we're, we're selecting that the beads are moving into this channel only. Okay, so for this first part of the talk, which I should give credit to Shua Long, this is uh, all really Shua Long's work and uh, I'm just a storyteller, I guess, <laughs> but it leads on, uh, it, it, it was just interesting to talk about it. Uh, so this was the feed roller and uh, where we can rotate gears in opposite direction and we can get this 3D manipulation where beads, we can get beads to hop into corrals. And then the second part uh, was this gear train where we can have active gears, which we call motors driving passive gears. So we get this mechanical advantage. And we can also transform rotary motion into linear motion. And I showed the microfluid valve. Okay, moving on to biology. Uh, so the goal is, of this second part of the talk is to isolate rare neural stem cells from cell suspension from a brain tissue. Um, so we're using the same structure where we have these four corrals into this chamber. Um, so I'm not using the simple just spacers, I, I'm, I'm actually forming this chamber and it makes it easier uh, to collect the cells once they're in the corrals uh, and also do some uh, medium exchange. And we can have several of these on one slide. Uh, it just makes it more efficient, I guess, in manufacturing. Uh, so the idea would be to park the optoelectronic robot and then we load cells and then we identify the target cells. So I'll just, uh, instead of talking through it now, I do have, so the, the first part would be here where we, we collect the micro robots through the syringe pump, we're pulling negative pressure. So we're getting some robots distributed here and then we use uh, the light to move it inside one of the corrals. Uh, this is because in the next step, when we're loading cells, we can wash away the, the robots by mistake if we're not careful. So that's just the first step. We're moving it into the into the corral. And then this is where just loading cells. Uh, this is cells moving into the device. And then this slide actually took the most effort uh, because there's a lot of cells that were annotated by uh, Phil. And I need to give a lot of credit to uh, Harrison who developed this uh, nice GUI to control everything and, all, and, and the, the convolutional neural network that was trained to detect the cells even though they're not um, fluorescent, but it can detect the, cell, the target cells. Um, so this was trained using bright field images. The ground truth had fluorescent images, but that was a one-time thing. And we don't really need to, for every, every time use fluorescent mice. We don't need GFAP mice every experiment. And then we can actually move this cell. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to get a good video showing both the AI at work and the motion. Uh, so it's hard to see, I guess, but there is a cell here that was identified to be a target cell. And then we're collecting that and moving around the device and parking it into this corral. 
And then this is done in uh, a kind of a low conductivity medium, uh, but it still has some um, uh, essential amino acids and other stuff for the cell to be viable. And that, that was a lot of work to get a good uh, medium that works well with the, with the optoelectronic tweezers and the, doesn't really hurt the cells. And then, but for the next step, we, uh, we actually can wash the cells with supplemented SFM so that at the end, when we collect it in a 96 well plate, we, it's cultured in just the supplemented SFM to give a uh, higher uh, chance of it forming neurospheres without any of the low conductivity uh, OET medium that we needed to, to do this uh, manipulation. Okay, so for the next steps would be to combine this with uh, Laurent's autonomous navigation. Um, you can appreciate that what what we what the videos I showed moving the robot around that was sped up like a lot. Some videos were sped up like sixteen times or more. Uh, so um, Laurent's autonomous navigation will really come in handy to make sure we can decrease the experiment time. And uh, there are things I'm doing in parallel uh, to redesign the device so that it's all smaller and the robot needs to move less distances also to reduce the amount of time that the cell is, is, is exposed to this non -con uh, low conductivity medium. And then uh, this, th this last video is the past few videos I showed were just for an experiment that we did uh, just last week. Uh, so we weren't able to really assess the viability and whether they actually form your spheres. So there's a lot more work to be done. This is kind of work in progress. There's not too much data that we have from this work yet. Uh, but there was a bonus I wanted to show. This one was actually taken even before I joined the lab, but it's uh, fun to show uh, that we could move neurospheres and uh, we can make them into a snowman and, uh, since we're in Canada. This one, uh, Shua Long and, and Erica took this video. It wasn't me, but it's just part of my story. <laughs> okay, and with that, I'd like to uh, thank uh, the Wheeler Lab. Uh, this picture doesn't have a lot of the, pe the people who worked with me, but this was the only picture I had without masks. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. And I won't take more of your time. Thanks, Mohammed. Um, I, I wanted to ask, I mean, the, the, the micro machines look fascinating. Do you think, well, what's the scope for actually introducing those into conventional microfluidic formats? Is, is the idea that you could add them to existing designs and systems? And, and what are the constraints there? Uh, there are a lot of, I, I thought about a lot of useful applications, but I haven't had a strong uh, interest from, uh, from, from, uh, to actually start doing it. Uh, so one idea would be, uh, we know that certain stem cells need certain uh, shear stresses to grow a certain way. I'm talking mainly about bone. Um, so there has been a lot in the past trying to control this shear stress uh, using sophisticated microfluidic geometries, but I, I envision we can do this using these uh, flow vortices uh, in a more controlled or more, shall I say, single cell accuracy. So if I, if I want to um, expose certain specific cells to a certain shear stress and not others uh, and, and see how that affects things, that's an idea that comes to mind. Thanks. Great. Uh, well, as, 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 um... I think we touched on at the start, you know, this should be, hopefully this is uh, the genesis of future collaborations and obviously encourage attendees and people to reach out and continue the conversation. But I think I just take this opportunity to thank all the speakers in, in this session and the preceding one. I think it's some fascinating talks and highly multidisciplinary. So just to finish off our symposium, I want to hand over to Dan Stoyanoff, who's a professor um, in the Department of Computer Science at UCL and the director of the, the Weiss Institute um, at UCL, under which a lot of this research activity takes place. Um, and yeah, thanks again, everyone. Over to you, Dan. 
Thanks, Mike, and thanks, everybody. I won't keep you for very long. I'm sure that folks across the Atlantic are eager to get to lunch, and uh, folks on this side of the Atlantic are probably eager to close their working day. Um, so I just want to thank uh, everybody for today. I think it's been a, a wonderful uh, exhibition of some fantastic work spanning life science and biology uh, through to computer vision, AI, micro robotics. Um, and so, you know, I think it's such an exciting field uh, for all of us to be involved in. And the synergy between these different specialties is particularly exciting. Um, I've always been involved in translational research work. And so um, it's very exciting for us at the Y Center to see how uh, this, um, you know, this synergy between different research fields can actually result in translational work that can hopefully one day uh, contribute to uh, enhancing life and, and uh, providing treatments that are not available today. Um, so thank you all for all of the amazing presentations, especially uh, uh, the keynote speakers, uh, really mind blowing work, um, clearly years of research that has gone into it. So it was wonderful to see it, even if some of it was way above uh, my head uh, because it's not in my specialty area, but really, really fantastic. So thank you, uh, thank you all. And also thank you to uh, all of the organizers at the University of Toronto. So Aaron, Cindy, and, and everyone on the wider team, um, and at UCL, uh, Mike and others. Um, thank you all for, for the collaboration and also for leading this workshop and this organization. Um, it would have been amazing to have it in person. Uh, I think we're emerging it back into the in-person world, but clearly not quite. Um, so hopefully in the years to come, uh, we can see uh, more collaborations and more events uh, like this uh, where we can uh, discuss. Um, so not much else to add. Just uh, again, thank you all and um, really, really enjoyed it. I hope it's the first of many. Uh, claps over Zoom always sound a little bit funny, but <laughs> there we go. <laughs>Mike, I don't know if you had any other closing remarks or Aaron's in the... That's it from me, I guess, um, unless anyone from Toronto wants to, to chip in, I guess we should close. I think we're good. To thank Amy for, for yeah. making this all work so well. Great. Apologies, Amy, I forgot to, to thank you as well as the, the master coordinator and uh, hey. the, the one pulling all the strings in the background. So thanks a lot to, to Amy as well from the, from the Y set. Bye. And to everyone attending too. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you. All right. Thanks all. Cheers.